If you, if you could please take your seats, we'll get started in a minute or two. Thank you. Okay, thank you all for uh, coming. My name is Milind Dev. I'm the director of uh, Energy and Geoscience Institute, EGI. I'm also a professor of chemical engineering uh, here at the University of Utah. Uh, welcome to our uh, annual conference. Uh, this is going to be an exciting day of presentation and panels over the next uh, a uh, couple of days, uh, and I'll give a quick introduction to uh, EGI uh, in this presentation, and then uh, introduce the next session, which is the geothermal session. So, for those of you who are not familiar with EGI, we are a multifaceted institute at the University of Utah, uh, doing all aspects of energy research. University of Utah is the flagship university of the state, uh, which does about $600 million per year in research annually, uh, with the goal of uh, moving towards a billion, and that's a stated goal of the current uh, president. EGI has had a 50-year history, uh, mostly in frontier exploration and geothermal science and technology. Uh, and lately, we have also had a strong portfolio of uh, carbon management projects, CCUS projects. And now, just as with uh, most of the other energy institutes around the world, we are working on all aspects of energy transition while keeping in mind that energy security is important as well. So the current portfolio of uh, EGI projects is fairly diverse. Uh, we do have a strong presence in geothermal uh, anchored by uh, this uh, once in a generation project called Forge, and you'll hear all about it this morning. There are a few other uh, associated um, projects, and then we are also look, working on conventional geothermal with geysers LLC and some low temperature geothermal applications. As I mentioned, we have a significant portfolio in carbon capture and utilization. Um, a, a few projects that are, uh, we, we, we were the science lead in the Southwest Partnership Project, um, a current carbon safe project, which I'll talk a little bit about and a couple of other uh, projects here. Um, and we have uh, some projects in carbon capture and utilization space. These are smaller, but again, mostly funded by the Department of Energy. We are negotiating a couple of other projects on uh, the direct air capture uh, DAC applications. Um, in the what can be considered conventional oil and gas, energy fluids, and minerals program, we have a membership program. Um, and some of our products are listed here, which you'll hear about tomorrow, EGI Connect a offshore database called ICORTS. We have a critical minerals database and we continue to do targeted exploration projects around the world. Um, and then we, on the upstream side of energy, we also have a professor at the, at, at the university working with us on decarbonization, energy efficiency, grid resilience, and hydrogen, which uh, you will talk, you will listen, you will hear about um, in the session tomorrow uh, afternoon. And then we have um, some projects in the uh, biofuels uh, arena. Um, this last year, we secured a grant for uh, what is called Resilient Energy Program, which is uh, basically a workforce development in energy transition, uh, which I'll briefly refer to 
at the end of this presentation. So as an institute, we do about uh, 20 to $25 million in research, which has uh, continued to uh, uh, stay uh, strong over the last uh, uh, several years. And we would like to grow this portfolio, both in federal, federally funded projects and industrially uh, funded uh, projects. So I would like to uh, acknowledge a couple of large uh, projects that are ongoing currently. So of course, the first one is uh, the Forge project, which I guess I said you'll hear about uh, this morning. Um, there was a lot, there were a lot of press stories about um, Forge, uh, New York Times, Wired Magazine, Scientific American, all of the uh, local newspapers. And um, we acknowledge the strong work of the Forge team led by Joe Moore, Dr. McLennan, um, Shirley Steff, uh, uh, Clay Jones here, uh, uh, Christine Pankov. Uh, you'll hear from most of, uh, most of these uh, uh, people uh, today. And then recently we were awarded this uh, UNTA Basin Carbon Safe Phase Two project led by Brian McPherson and his team. The PI on this project is uh, Ting Xiao, uh, working with Rob Simmons and Felicia Blanchard, uh, and 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 a strong team that uh, uh, that that's working with with this group. And uh, this uh, will be. Carbon capture and storage will be the topic of discussion uh, this afternoon. So in terms, when we talk about energy transition, I want, wanted to show you what's happening at least in the last 10 years. So there is the 2012 picture. Uh, some of these numbers I think are not coming, coming out very clearly. Uh, I just want to point out that uh, from the point of view of energy use, energy source, um, there was significant growth in renewables. They went from about 9% of the energy source to about 13 to 14% of the energy source. And coal went down um, by about 10% or so. So it made up, basically that difference was made up by coal. But the oil and gas use from 2012 to 20, 2022 increased from 62% to about 69%. Um, and again, it could be for various reasons, but for the most part, uh, coal is being substituted by what can be considered lower carbon fossil fuels. And that's what is happening in the last uh, 10 years or so. And then as a result of that, we are seeing a steady decline, even though it's not very consistent in, this is only the US, carbon dioxide emissions from EIA, the EIA numbers, uh, from about 6,000 um, me million metric tons to uh, a little less than 5,000. Uh, and then these are the projections going, going forward. So the decarbonization as we speak is happening in the industrial sector, in the transportation as electrification continues, um, and in, um, uh, I think across the board uh, in, 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 in a lot of the industries. But it's also now recognized that we need to not only decarbonize, but work with other aspects of uh, energy as well, uh, which is, uh, for example, water. Water has become a big component of it. The first uh, uh, line of battle here is energy efficiency and decarbonization. There is a lot of effort and EGI is uh, involved in that. And then looking at all of the energy sources that would make uh, this whole uh, connection between energy, climate, and, and, and water to be more harmonious. And um, as I said, we at EGI are looking at this whole uh, picture and you'll see this uh, over the next couple of days. Um, so looking forward uh, from, uh, energy fluids point of view, we are looking at the effective use of data and knowledge so as to lower the carbon footprint of current oil and gas resources to get most out of the resource that exists and to go after what are considered lower uh, footprint um, 
uh, oil and gas uh, resources and then seek transformation through integration of decarbonization energy efficiency, which you uh, uh, will hear about tomorrow, grid resiliency and security. Um, of course, uh, there is a lot of effort on uh, carbon capture, including direct air capture, and then doing something with this carbon dioxide. That is uh, the irony of all of this is that currently there is not enough carbon dioxide available for uh, use in various sectors, including, I think, enhanced oil recovery. So uh, this captured CO2 will, will have um, uh, uh, various utilization possibilities. And then our teams here are very, very strong in the storage component of that carbon dioxide that is captured. And then um, there is a lot of effort on effective mineral use as well. Um, so this is finding the right resource, um, extracting it efficiently, so that again, not to have uh, significant carbon footprint, but as everybody has recognized, energy transformation or energy transition is going to take a good bit of effort on critical mineral use. There is a uh, shortage anticipated in uh, not only lithium and some of the associated minerals, but uh, industrial minerals like nickel and cobalt and copper. So that I think is going to be the next frontier um, as well. And as we do this, we would like to continue to grow EGI's research portfolio for, I think, impact for the good of society. And of course, we are uh, academic institutions. So we work with uh, students and um, workforce development from that point of view is very important uh, for us as well. Uh, so from that perspective, we did start a, a new initiative. It's called Resilient Energy uh, Program. There are currently five courses in this program, and we are seeking a certificate from the university on those five courses. Uh, those are in a, a geoscience for energy transition, alternate energy, which includes all forms of energy, including oil and gas. Uh, CCUS, uh, carbon capture utilization and sequestration. Um, there is a lot of uh, activity going on in the energy entrepreneurship space. So we would like to capture that in a formal fashion. So energy entrepreneurship is uh, one of these five courses. And then managing this energy effectively, energy management, including the grid um, is, is, is the last uh, course. Of these currently we have this fall, uh, geoscience for energy transition, Dr. Sarkar is teaching that, alternate energy, uh, Dr. Mohanty is teaching that, and then energy management, uh, Dr. Parvania is teaching that. The, the exciting part about this program is that we would also be developing micro-credentials for industry and training courses so that uh, the large research enterprise of EGI then gets a academic uh, outreach through uh, this program is uh, how we uh, envision that. So I think that is my um, last, uh, this is my last slide. Uh, the program consists basically of these four sessions. The first one we are going to kick off with our, uh, uh, as I said, the anchor signature project, Forge, uh, which uh, is most, it's mostly about enhanced geothermal system all aspects of it. And then on the panel, you will hear about uh, other uh, options of uh, uh, enhanced geothermal systems is to extracting heat in uh, areas where the reservoir does not exist. And second session this afternoon is basically on carbon dioxide, mostly on storage, but we will also have some discussion on capture. Um, uh, tomorrow's first session will be on energy fluids and minerals. And then we conclude with uh, energy efficiency, grid and hydrogen. So panel discussion tomorrow will be uh, on hydrogen. And I um, thank all the speakers who have agreed to, uh, especially external speakers who have agreed to come and um, uh, help us uh, make this program uh, successful. And fine, on Thursday, we have a trip of 
the Great Salt Lake, mostly about uh, the geological aspect of it. Um, that Great Salt Lake has been in the news over the last uh, couple of years. So I think it's timely for us to see what it looks like now and uh, what it looks in a broader uh, context. And I would like to thank uh, our organizing staff. And of course, we had many others, but uh, Al Walker, Brooke Tucker, uh, Brian e. Richards, uh, Carol Smith, Aaron Becker, and uh, Ryan Madsen, who are helping on the IT side, Rob Simmons, and Jennifer Fitzgibbon. Uh, we have a, a, a large team of uh, supporting staff as well. Uh, thank you. And uh, with that, we'll kick off the, the first session, unless you have a question or two for me. Okay, I think we are on time, Jack. Our first uh, speaker for the next session on the enhanced geothermal system is uh, Professor John McLennan. He um, is a professor in chemical engineering, also, uh, I guess, strongly connected with, uh, with uh, uh, EGI. He's been at the university for about, I think, 20 years or so, and uh, uh, has had a strong uh, career uh, looking at uh, rock mechanics, um, geothermal systems, uh, shales, and a number of other applications. Uh, please welcome John McLean. I'm not sure. I need, do I need a microphone? No. Okay. So, uh, I've heard a lot about forage. The um, critical temperature for water. And in, in terms of this, we ask ourselves, well, what does forge really mean? Why, why did forge happen? And forge happened because the Department of Energy recognized that there was a gap, that conventional geothermal programs were constricted to geologically favorable environments where there was temperature, where there were fractures, and where there was native water that was in, in, in place. And people for 50 years have, have recognized that using the United States for an example, apologies to Christian, uh, that, that there are a lot of places where if we drill to a modest depth, we can find the heat. We may find the heat, but we may not find the fractures. We may not have the in situ fluids. So let's consider engineering a reservoir where we drill to the heat, we add the fractures, and we add the fluids in a circulating loop going through hydraulic fractures that we, we've created. So a real opportunity, but the Department of Energy recognized there were technology gaps and uh, went out to try and solve this. Now, there is a significant history of people trying to solve this, going back to the uh, middle 70s, where people were trying to create these enhanced geothermal systems, formerly known as hot, dry rock. And in the last little while, there's been um, some Im improvement in terms of these technologies. These previous systems uh, were not did not turn out to be commercial. So fundamentally, there were scientific and economic challenges associated with them. But I want to point out a recent one that has been successful, and this is Fervo Energy's operations at uh, Blue Mountain in Nevada, where they have drilled two horizontal wells. They've interconnected these wells with hydraulic fractures. They've done a 30-day circulation test, and they're just about ready to go to production from what I understand. So this is a really exciting change 
in the landscape of geothermal energy. If I had to take Forge and put it into the perspective of all of these things, Forge is not a commercial entity. Forge is a situation where it's a field laboratory that was conceived and implemented to carry out testing and de-risk is the term, I guess it's popular these days, de-risk tools and methods and concepts, prototype technologies that we could adapt so that other folks like, like yourselves in the room could commercialize the geothermal technology. So we'll just walk through Forge a, a, a little bit here. And the concept is as follows, okay? So let's suppose that we drill an injection well, and our wells were drilled at 65 degrees to the vertical um, for scientific reasons. As you saw from the profile of the forge operations, horizontal is where we will likely go. So you drill an injection well, and then subsequently in the forge program, we carried out three hydraulic fractures at the toe of this injection well. And the purpose of those hydraulic fractures was one, to test out basic hydraulic fracturing technology, but two, to also monitor micro seismicity. So we had a profile that indicated the vertical extent of the hydraulic fractures. So we could drill a second well to intersect that micro seismic cloud and um, have a reasonable chance that there was some degree of, would be some degree of connection between the hydraulic fractures and the injection well and the production. And so then subsequently, and this, this will happen subsequently in our forge well starting next year, uh, populate this real estate with additional hydraulic fractures. So in a commercial situation, you'll have this network of hydraulic fractures that are communicating between an injector and a producer. And ultimately in a commercial situation, such as what Fervo has um, uh, and, and Chevron and other people are envisioning, you'd be injecting cold water producing hot water to the surface and converting that, uh, that thermal energy to electric energy. Um, and the point here too, is that what are these hydraulic fractures done? They've created surface area. And so that's appropriate for our particular situation, but you're also gonna hear from people from Evor who are creating that surface area by drilling. And so there are multiple ways to get to the same, uh, the same end point of having a surface area that fluid can pass by and that working fluid can take fluid heat from the formation and convert that to electrical energy. So over the past five or six years, we've drilled a number of wells at Forge for this mission. And the first well was this 5832 well, and we've drilled a number of other vertical monitoring wells as time goes on. But we have an injector, oops, I'm sorry. We have an injector that we've drilled, and we'll call that 16A. And that injector, as I said, was 65 degrees to the horizontal. It was drilled a little bit to the south of east. And uh, this extent here, I forget, uh, for about 4,000 feet of lateral. Uh, total length of the well, just under 11,000 feet. And then, as I said, we did fractures here. And then subsequently, this last summer, we just drilled this well, which is about 300 feet above the previously drilled well. And um, passing through the zone that was hydraulically fractured. Now, the thing to remember about these wells is, is, is and I'll go back, and, I'll, and I'll, go, I'll go back, is that one of the biggest challenges that we have at Forge and our colleagues everywhere have is temperature and engineering operations at these temperatures that we're dealing with. And you can see from the Forge operations that these temperatures are not inconsequential. You can look at this plot of temperature versus depth. And so once we get down to reservoir depth, we're talking about temperatures in the range of 450 degrees Fahrenheit. There are geothermal program um, operations that are much hotter than that, but this is sort of a, a sweet spot for conversion of electricity, at least with con conventional technology. And, and, and so bear this in mind, the temperature is a very challenging issue. And it turns out that these temperatures are, um, um, more significant than what we typically see in the oil patch. So it, this is a plot of oil field operations. And you can see other than, the, other than a couple up, up, up here, a mobile bay in the Gulf, uh, that the temperatures are you know, somewhere below 220 degrees C at the most extreme. Now Forge is low, relatively low temperature and it fits up in this temperature here. 
and the geysers is way up and and I, I don't know what it, you guys blue mountain maybe a little bit lower in blue mountain this Fergal has the same temperatures as us in their operations in near milford utah but these are the temperatures that we have to deal with and they have many many consequences in terms of your engineering operations any sort of elastomeric material that you're going to deal with has to be a, a premium and we've had a lot of trouble with fill fill filled rubbers and, and elastomers that we've been using. And this impacts us in terms of things like frack plugs and various isolation devices. Even more significant are batteries and electronics, okay? Lithium batteries rated to maybe 345 Fahrenheit maximum. And even with chilled drilling fluids, we're drilling at temperatures that are approaching that or above that. So electronics, and uh, batteries are a big, big concern in the geothermal industry. So I thought I'd go through this and, and rather than just being promotional, I thought I'd give us a report card, okay? Uh, there are things we've done okay. There are things that we need to, need to improve. And in, just in terms of dealing with temperature in general, we found out that you know, there are a lot of things that are troublesome and we've managed to get around them. I mean, in terms of ruggedized bit designs, tolerating temperatures, the industry was already there. We, we, we didn't bring anything to the table. We just pushed bit technology, new bit technology. One of the things that I'll talk about that was a very favorable demonstration was insulated drill pipe. That, that is something that um, can make a significant difference in terms of temperature. Logging, and I know Fervo just mentioned, um, Emma just mentioned that Fervo has, has done successful logging. This is done through the bit so that we can access um, higher temperature applications. So you're running your logging tools through a bit. You, you go down hole on pipe, you pump your logging holes down, they go through a, uh, an opening on the bit, they latch, you, re you release the, uh, uh, the wet connect, and then you log on memory on the, way, on the way out. And it has worked extremely well. And so this has been a success. Successful fracturing, we've got around it. There's a lot of things that yet need to be done. So let's let's look at what some of those things are. Y you know, we manage with drilling, but we're aggressively chilling and cooling the drilling fluid as, as we're going on. And not, not an in insignificant expense as this goes on. And uh, you're always fighting, as I said, with batteries. We've had close calls with these batteries. And an exploding lithium battery is a severe consequence on location. It, it uh, um, involves people in hazmat suits. And, and so it's something that we, we really want to uh, uh, avoid. Logging, uh, still improvements. We want to convince the, the vendors to go to higher temperature. Now, there are some high temperature logging tools, but most of them are restricted to the 275, three, 300 to 350 range uh, Fahrenheit. Um, stimulation. Lots of things that we, we, we need to do in terms, of, in terms of temperature. Prop, we need to be able to carry prop in. And the implications of that is you need a viscosified fluid. And why do I say slick water may or may not work? I say slick water may or may not work because you're having to lift fluid vertically, at least in our case. I, I think in the future, we'll offset the wells maybe so that you get a better sweep, thermal, thermal sweep and going up. But lots of things in hydraulic fracturing that can be can, can be considered. And operations, whether this works at all, how the thermal depletion is, is yet to be determined. Although optimistic information from um, um, Fervo's operate, field operations. The next thing that we, we wanna look at a little bit is, is from a geologic perspective. And um, I was talking to Clay Jones just before the meeting. Our, we have core laid out that we, we've, we've, we've cut. And I said, Clay, there's not too many fractures in this. And he said he, he, brought out, he brought out the longest pieces that he could find. So there are pieces that have fractures. So fractures, are they relevant? Are they not relevant? Uh, there's some mysteries that we need, we need to sort out here rather than just challenges. And so as you'll see from the rock, and, and maybe you'll hear more from, from Clay, it varies from granitic to nisic as a, as a function of, of, of depth. And the consequences of that, this is a hard abrasive rock that can uh, provide a challenge to stabilizers to, and, and, and drilling operations. The other thing that is always a mystery is that the oil patch envisions fractures like this. And this is actually from the, I believe it's the Eagle Ford, yeah. Uh, where the microseismicity suggests very, very linear hydraulic fracturing growth. It says a relative independence of the lithology and any sort of natural fractures that are present. 
you have to ask yourself in a harder, definitely fractured formation. This is an oak crop of the actual reservoir. I mean, it's been it's it's been exhumed and and eroded, so the fractures are exaggerated. But do these fractures play a role? And this remains something that we don't quite understand. At the other end of the spectrum, we look at the logs that we get from this reservoir. We see a, a huge degree of complexity showing up on FMI logs, less so on UBI, which is commonly the case, and even less so on core. And so you ask yourselves, what are we really mapping on these rocks? That's something that, that intrigues me um, in particular. Also a lot of work in terms of understanding the variations in stresses. And this is kind of surprising, it, it, it's, it's covered up here, but this number is 0.59, I believe, is that we've gone, I don't know, what, 200 feet away, and the gradient is substantially changed. And so in a reservoir that we would nominally conceive to be relatively hom homogeneous batholith, we're seeing substantial variations in, in stress as a function of time. And stress is the geologic controlling factor that governs our engineering operations. The one thing, and, and I know Clay is going to talk about this, but I, I just want, I didn't find this on the web. I, 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 I found it from Clay Jones. <laughs> and and what, it, it, it was, it's, such a, it's such an interesting thing, and Clay will talk about it. I'm, I'm hoping, where is, there, you will talk about this, right? Yeah, that, that the occurrence of halite and sylvite and calcite in this granitic reservoir. And, 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 and so I don't wanna be a spoiler. So you're gonna to have to wait to hear, uh, hear about that. But the other thing that was even more interesting or e equally interesting was after the fracks that we did, we flowed this reservoir back. And as you can see here, the salinities went from basically fresh water to thousands of parts per million. And we produced back eight metric tons of solids. And and, and you say to yourself, wow, where is this coming from? Is this gonna continue? This is a granitic reservoir, mind you. And uh, my thought was, is this something that we can use in terms of stimulation? That, that, so, I mean, there are positives and negatives and it's incredibly intriguing. And so if we look at our role in terms of reservoir characterization and understanding these natural fractures, to date it hasn't impacted drilling, but you know, the day is young. Um, no significant losses, effective, effective mapping with FMI and UBI with, with Throughbit. Uh, Deep Sonic has been incredibly insightful to me, processing sonic data that you're already inquiring and looking for reflectors that are 30, 50, 60 feet away from the well bore is really something that is particularly useful. Uh, flowback measurements for stress, we don't have enough time to talk about it. If, if you want, I saw Pong Zhu Jing walk in, he can talk to you uh, about that and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, but what do we need to do? Um, you know, I, I still think there's a lot of things that we don't know. And so with apologies to Donald Rumsfeld, you know, we don't know what we don't know, what we don't know, and, and we don't know. And, and one of the things that we found with the drilling and one of the real issues of the drilling that we'll go into in a second is significant, significant vibrations when we were drilling. And this is something that we really need to, to address in our drilling operations, particularly when we're running rotary steerables, that huge, huge vibrations, as I'll show you. And so, and then uh, I'm, I'm personally wondering, you know, are there as many fractures as that we think? And that has significant implications in terms of the modeling that you carry out because you want to represent um, um, a stochastic, you want a stochastic representation of fractures that occur. So, and once again, operations, it's too early to tell. How these fractures are contributing. So we'll move on, and, and so we're doing okay there. Uh, drilling technology, we're doing fantastic. I'll, I'll give us an A plus. Okay, we've gone from using roller cone bits, which was a geothermal standard, and what we've got here is depth versus time. This is just actual drilling time. How long you're on bottom. This is the first well we drilled. That it was a relatively shallow well, and it took a long time to drill. As we went to polycrystal and diamond compact bits and changed bit technologies and procedures, we dramatically, maybe four times, increased the rate of penetration and increased the time, um, uh, the time that a particular bit was useful. Now, th this, is, this is not universal. However, so bit technology is, is, has, been, has been favorable. The second thing that was a really nice test, and, and, and maybe Christian is, will, will talk about it further, 
is Evor provided insulated drill pipe. And so as, as part of Forge testing out new technologies, we said, yes, we want to try this. And so there is drill pipe that's insulated with a, an external coating and an internal coating. And the purpose is to reduce bottom hole temperature. And so here is how it, it, this performed. And so, um, Christian, this may be the only mistake in your report. We need to cross out non there. Um, I'm teasing you. Um, so what we've got is we've got temperature that was measured at the MWD, measurement well drilling. So it's a downhole tool, um, you know, a couple hundred feet above the bit that's going to tell you what the temperature is. And so we have MWD measurements um, in, um, in orange, okay? And we have uh, simulations that were done by Ever in blue. And, and their model has been... Um, um, evaluated extensively for its accuracy. And so what whatever did is they matched the temperatures with the MWD data up to this point. And then we measured, then we ran the insulated drill pipe. And you can see that the uh, simulated temperature was much, much above the actual measured temperature. And, you know, we're talking about 25 to 40 degrees C. And so what that does is that means if you can effectively run some sort of insulated drill pipe, what you're doing is that you're protecting your downhole tools at a minimum, at a minimum, you're protecting your downhole tools and extending the depth at which you can use batteries and electronics and, and your drilling. And there is even some, some indication that it may actually impact your drilling rate, but we won't go there. One of the other successes that we had, we owed our, our relationship with, uh, to Fred DePriest and Sam Neunert, who are professors at Texas A&M. And we worked with them extensively to input um, calculations of mechanical specific energy based on bit parameters that we've measured. So this is just a, an indication of energy that is expended by the bit to drill the rock. And if you can see that the mechanical specific energy, is, and that's in this column for one example, so you're measuring depth in this direction, mechanical specific energy, and you can see some sort of a baseline. There are variations in the rock type. But once you see the mechanical specific energy deviating from that trend and progressively increasing, that bit is no longer green. It's time to. It's getting to time to pull that bit, and so what we, uh, what I attribute to those guys is um, introduction to the the community of extensive use of mechanical specific energy and techniques to look at actually what is happening from your drilling information, identifying when things are going wrong, and then going about changing them. So we did really well on this. On on this, this is from the first inclined well that we drilled. And, and we thought we did really well until we started to look at the morphology of the hole. So these are reconstructions from ultrasonic borehole imagers. So basically you're ranging to determine the dimensions of your well bore um, all along the length of the well bore acoustically. And so this is about 10 foot long. This is about eight and three quarter inches. And you can see very, very rough and, and, and spiral. And this, you say, well, what's the big deal with this? Well, it's a particularly big deal when you're running casing, when you're running fibers behind casing, you're looking for pinch points. When you're hydraulically fracturing these wells, if my casing is in contact with this, with one of these ridges, and I don't have an effective cement job, I'm in a position for a pinch point and failure of, of, of the casing. So it's a significant issue. So we said on the next well, we're going to use a rotary steerable system, where basically rather than sliding and, and rotating, um, explicitly, we have a device that does that. And a remarkably smooth hole developed from that. So we're happy with the rotary steerable, except there were significant vibrations that, and, and, and the vibrations, you know, really wore down this stabilizer. And this is a roller reamer. Um, basically, it's, it's, it's a, a, a device that has rollers with these nubs on it. There's three of them. And you can see that these are really beaten up. And that's all because of vibrations. And you can say, well, vibrations, you know, why are those significant? Tool damage, we had a lot of repair costs because of vibrations. It impacts your rate of penetration. And you can see that they were not insignificant. Here, here's an indication of lateral vibrations at near the bit. Okay, so bashing in this, in this direction. We had lots of sensors to tell this. Axial vibrations were a little, were a little bit less. And you say, well, is, eh, is this a big deal? Well, it's a big deal when you look at full scale on this is 20 times the acceleration of gravity. So we were having vibrations that, that were at 15 Gs. And, you know, this, uh, 
this wears on tools, to put it mildly. Anyways, so this, this is one thing that we do want to overcome. We also had another program that was quite interesting here, where we ran particle drilling. And this, this was from a joint venture between uh, Reed Heikelog NOV and a company called Particle Drilling Technology. And this is, this is a particle drilling bit. And, and actually what you're doing is, is, is that you're injecting steel, they're like BBs, they're about the same size of BBs, and you're eroding the rock in this direction and you're following through with um, um, polycrystalline diamond cutters on, on, on the gauge to, wear, to open up the hole. Um, and you can see from some laboratory tests, this is kind of what this is kind of what happens that the particles do something like this, and then you go back in with the cutters on the side and they clean that hole out remarkably. And we were looking for this, you know, once to get straight hole and, and smooth hole. Yeah. Um, some additional some adi oh, sorry. Going on. Oh, no problem now. Uh, if I can figure out how to go backwards. Yeah, and a lot of coring. So please take a look at the core that's laid out, out outside the room. And uh, we have it under armed guard, my dear. Okay, so tired. So let's go through this. Okay. Drilling and coring. The training made a big difference. Uh, a workflow is really, really important. A disciplined workflow. And, and the training that we did, we did this with all hands. Rig hands in, included. It cost us a bunch of money, but I think it paid off. Uh, unprecedented increases in rate of penetration, et cetera, et cetera. You can, you can read all of this. The things that probably need to be done is, can these learnings be applied to different geologic circumstances where you have, um, um, you, know, you, you have dikes, you have interfacial severity where you're going from one formation to another. And so there's, there's some room that needs to, work that needs to go on there, vibrations in BHA. So drilling, we did okay. I, I give ourselves an A in drilling. Um, fiber, we ran three fiber optic strings in this last well, and you can see these fiber optic strings coming out of an adapter over the liner hanger um, at, 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 at the surface. And so these strings were run outside of the casing in this particular well. There was a, a silica string, um, um, a shell string, and a, um, a Baker Hughes pressure temperature gauge that was run. And, and you can see actually, um, where is it? This is a fiber optics reel. This is Shell's cable that was run in. It's, it's kind of like uh, if you've ever done wiring in your house, this is kind of like what that is like, except it's even stiffer than that. And a lot of work to go on to install this fiber. Um, um, Josh, I don't have enough time to run this movie as I, as I planned last night, but um, I can send it to you. This is really a complicated uh, operation to in install this. Um, hey, we got 15 minutes, no problem. We'll run the first minute or so of, the, of this movie. And what you can see is this is the rig hands and, and Baker hands. And, they, and, and you can see that we've got an elevated set, set of slips that hydraulically operated. Um, and you just assume not drop anything down the hole. Um, and, and you can see there's a centralizer there and they're gonna put on one clamp here and, and uh, butt it on with lock screws. And I just wanna show you the complexity of this operation. They're gonna pull this back up and then pull, um, install a long clamp that goes over all of the fi fiber optics. A really, really a very slick, tedious operation. And, and the care that was taken in terms of doing this really paid off because all of our cables are, are functional. Um, and so in a second here, you're gonna see that they're gonna put up the casing, the, the fiber protector. Uh, fairly soon. Okay, here we come. And so it's it's a long, complicated gizmo that um, goes over goes over the fibers, and yeah, here we go. And and then it's uh, lock screws all all the way along along the length of it. And so this is a tedious operation. It took uh, three days to run the casing. Anyways, that's 
I couldn't resist. And so that just means I'll, I'll cut out some other stuff. And so the fibers were great. We've had fantastic interpretation of the data from the fiber, really good, good interactions with Nubrex and with Celixa to come up with looking at uh, waterfall plots from this data. And that's going to on go for so much longer. Um, and, you know, I give ourselves an, uh, an A in this as well. It was really uh, a success. Cementing technology, we're, we're in the B minus to C category here. Okay. I think that there's a lot of room from a geothermal perspective to improve cementing. Just about every well we've drilled and cemented, we've had difficulties. Um, the, and just in terms of the last well, the surface casing went in fine. The intermediate the job went perfectly. It was a classic job, except the cement fell 500 feet. And you know why does it fell 500 feet? We think we know the stress regime in the area, but we still haven't fixed that, figured that out. The production well, there was poor mixing and there was some fallback, so top jobs. Well, we couldn't do a top job on, on, on this well, so we'll just have to wait and figure out what we're doing. But I think in terms of, um, this, is a, this is a B minus or a C, we need to really improve cement. We've done a lot of fracturing on these wells, as I said, at the toe of the 16B well. Um, a lot of monitoring going on, and I'm just gonna skip through all of this. Three different stages, three different fluids, People can uh, hit me up and we can talk about the various fluids. I mean, this is this is my favorite part of the whole presentation. No, I, I, but I've got 20 minutes. To... <laughs> <laughs> A lot of flowback that Clay is gonna talk about. Very, very interesting things in flowback. It's an extremely tight reservoir. We flowed back each one of these stages because we had to run bridge plugs and we didn't want to snub in the hole. Uh, uh, and. And uh, uh, we got back about 50% of the fluid in, in, each, in each particular case. And we ran distinct tracers in each stage. And as we drilled out the, the plugs, we started to see the different tracers coming in. And what it indicated that there was no interaction between the, the three particular stages that we had. And so that was something that was good news. I think one of the highlights of everything that we've done is the micro seismic reconstruction of the three stages. You can see stage one, here, so here's the toe. Stage one was actually pumped here. We didn't see any micro seismicity here, but eventually it started here and it grew back and it grew back on an angle. So maybe natural fractures do have a role to play. That was a slick water open hole frack. This one, uh, stage two, was cased and perforated, and it looks like it's getting more what we think. And stage three was a cross link carboxymethyl hydroxy propyl guar, and that had enough viscosity even at these temperatures to uh, resist moving into natural fractures and it gave a very planar feature. So really, really tremendously successful. Um, we fired our guns, plugs went in fine, but we still have a lot to do and we're planning our next round of fracks right now. And the variables on our, our next round of fracks include uh, running cl um, um, clusters, testing out different fluids and actually pumping properly. So finally, um, Part, uh, in, in, a, in a subsequent part of this presentation, we have circulated between these two wells. And uh, so basically what we have established is two wells drilled, three fractures, and we did two circulation tests to assess the communication be between these wells. And uh, Hong Zhujing will talk about this. And so I'm not gonna spoil his talk. There is a connection. However, it's not commercial quality. And we need to improve that connection. And that's one of the goals of our upcoming fracturing camp, up, upcoming fracture campaign. So just to finish this off um, is, is where are we going? Um, um, and th the next stage of a forge will be um, a fracturing campaign on this well, somewhere in this domain where we'll have up to seven stages that will pump and, and will vary the fluids, the clusters, the perforating program, and uh, the prop and schedules that, 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 we're, that we're pumping. Following that, there will be an extended period of, of circulation that will circulate between the two wells. So we'll go into 16B as well and log where those fibers are and then perforate and circulate, um, uh, do a long-term circulation test. Subsequent to that, the plans are somewhat up in the air, but they, they will in, in, entail drilling additional wells and additional testing. And so this sort of comes back to our overall goal of what Forge is. It's 
it's it's not it's not a commercial entity um, by any means, uh, and its its intent is to test out tools, provide opportunities to vendors and 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 colleagues to test out test out equipment and and to sort of promote the overall development of geothermal energy within the industry, and so. This has been, uh, there's a lot of people that I'd, I'd like to ex express thanks to. Um, a lot of them are sitting in this, in this room um, and then certainly to the Department of Energy for funding this, this major project. Um, so I do probably, do I have five minutes for questions? If not, I'll go back and talk about the hydraulic fracturing. Yes, John. Or Arnis. The particle drilling was a disappointment because of continued erosion. And so they've gone back and they're doing some redesign and they'll be trying out additional tests. And so uh, maximum rate, something like 60 feet per hour. So not, not the worst, not, not, not the best, but they're, they, they've done bit redesigns and they'll be trying it out, I think, in their Occidental project uh, um, coming up. Uh, no, the particle injector suffered. Okay. So the issue, the issue there is 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 market motivation. If the vendors, if the vendors see um, an opportunity in the geothermal spec spectrum, they will endeavor to try and do this. But at the present time. We've been using available technology. Yes, Josh. So with being sub-commercial, uh, do you think that you guys took what you did and scaled it along the lateral? Do you feel like you have something that was closer to commerciality, or is that... You're going to hear from Ever, but, uh, who believes that they have something along these lines that's going to be commercial. We, sure. we think that's become commercial. And one of the reasons, in particular, is the improvements in drilling technology. You know, at one time, people would say that 50% of the capital expenditure of an enhanced geothermal plant or operation was going to be drilling. Now it's probably down to 20%. And, and, so, and so it's getting uh, it's getting in the range where it can compete with electricity from solar and wind. Even that end, like us guys in oil and gas would say, you know, a typical well now, maybe a third of your cost is drilling, most of it being stimulation. I was kind of wondering if you thought that the lack of commerciality was something you still have some evolution on the stimulation side to create uh, that better connection? No, no question. No, no question. And, and when I said non-commercial, I just say, you know, we don't have a commercial right. bone in our body. Whereas, whereas Evor Ev Ev and, and Fervo, they believe that technologies like this, they can and will commercialize. And so our goal is to be sort of the guinea pig is is to is to try out some of these fracturing techniques. You know, we just had a meeting last week about about clustering. I mean, there's there's one camp that wants ten clusters um, for a single stage, and there's another camp that wants to you know try out the science and do a single cluster. And so we'll we'll try and do some sort of combination in between so that we can provide guidance um, and 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 some sort of uh, uh, test bed for these things. And so I'm convinced it will become commercial. Yes, I, I, I believe that's going to be the case because, you know, one of the things that we'll be doing is, is after we do the next set of fracks, we'll be doing a 30-day a circulation test, plus or minus 30 days. Then we'll frack the rest of the well. I don't know when that'll be, but then it'll be an extended circulation test. And, and that we'll, we'll be having pumps and equipment that, that will allow us to circulate for years. And that is one of the unknowns, right? Is how close can you put these fractures before you have thermal depletion? Are these fractures gonna interact? Is this fracture gonna talk to this fracture so that you have dead zones and, and, and short circuiting? And how can I overcome that by using engineering technology? For example, using a viscous fluid as opposed to a slick water, a slick water is likely gonna be a more diff 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 diffuse interconnecting system than, than, than uh, 
um, a viscosified fluid. At least that's my perception at the present time. So yes, it will be it will be an asset. And it reminds me, I I, I need to thank TLA because uh, they've really made a lot of this possible in in uh, um, uh, and and being a, a very nice partner in in, in this operation. Our, uh, next speaker is uh, Dr. Christine Pankov. She is the Associate Director of the University of Utah Central Foundation. Dr. Christine Pankov is the Associate Director of the University of Utah Seismograph Station and a research professor in the Department of Geology yeah, and yeah, Physics. Yeah, okay. She is the lead for the Seismic <laughs> Frontier Observatory for Research in Geothermal Energy, which is FORGE. She is also the Secretary of Seismological Society of America, is the Advanced National Seismic System Regional Coordinator for the Intermountain Region and a member of the Utah Mine Safety Technical Advisory Council. She received her PhD in Earth Science and Geophysics Specialty from University of California, Santa Cruz. And since 2000, she has worked on, uh, as a seismologist at the University of Utah. We are very fortunate to have Dr. Christine Pankow. Please welcome. Thank you. All right. And I'm going to thank John for giving the introduction. So I threw out a bunch of slides from my can talk. So, no, no, they're not in here. So you covered what I want. I was hoping you'd do. So thank you. Um, so before I start, I lead the seismic monitoring, but we have a great team. Um, in particular, I want to note Jim Rutledge. Uh, many of you might know him. He was with Schlumberger for a while at Los Alamos for a while. Now he has his own company. I have a great team of postdocs, researchers, and students at seismograph stations. And we work very closely with GeoEnergy Swiss. And they're, they're really keen to develop this technology because they're hoping to uh, move into production in Switzerland. So um, this is, will be different. I'm a seismologist. I catch half the words that John talks about some of the times with some of the lingo. So, this will be different, so I'll give you a different lingo. So if I'm, you don't understand, raise your hand and I'll try and explain. Um, and seismic monitoring here, there's two phases. Um, hazard in terms of induced earthquakes and then the reservoir scale monitoring. And I wanna touch a little bit on both of that because as John said, this is a research facility and there's still a lot of work to be done in de-risking um, the, the uh, risk from uh, induced earthquakes. Um, and then on the seismic reservoir scale, it's more sort of what can we actually map? So there's a lot of great um, research going on on the seismology side as well. So for the local seismic network, um, this is a largely a surface network. Um, we have a mix of stations out here. We have um, one shallow borehole. It goes to uh, 300 meters, 1,000 feet. Is that me? Okay. Um, it's FORK. It's also on the 6832 pad. We have a geophone and an accelerometer at depth. We have two rings of, of instruments at three kilometers and eight kilometers. If it starts with FSB, it's a shallow borehole. So it's um, 100, 150 feet. Um, the three kilometer ring has um, broadband and accelerometer sensors. The eight kilometer ring has broadband sensors. Um, most of the FOR stations are broadband on the surface, and um, FORB, FORW, and MHS are all accelerometers. So this network is designed for seismic hazard, or that's what we were largely put it in for, was capturing the induced earthquakes. And why is that important? Um, induced earthquakes and geothermal, like in many of our energies, uh, resources have caused a lot of problems. And it, in particular, in geothermal, the Basel earthquake um, in Switzerland was a 3.4, okay? It caused damage in the historical city of Basel and it shut down geothermal in Switzerland. In 2009, we had the Pohong earthquake in South Korea. That was a hundred million dollar um, damages. A person died, okay? And it brought geothermal down as well. So 
we have to be really careful. And I didn't fully appreciate this because I was told, do seismic monitoring here, okay? I help run the seismic network. We get earthquakes out here, 3.4, 3 that's, you know, we get these in Utah, but they don't really cause damage. And so in terms of thinking about the hazard and risk, um, in my planning, I had to think about the hazard and risk to enhance geothermal. Okay, that was one of the comments I got back from the induced seismic mitigation plan. So I'm moving forwards to the traffic light system here, and some of you are going to go, oh, that's too conservative. But it's very conservative because we have to be really careful because of those two headline cases of Basel and Pohang. Okay. So if we back up and look at the background seismicity, we've been monitoring from seismograph stations this area going back to 1962. Our catalog, modern catalog goes back to um, um, 90 or 86. We have a historical catalog that goes back to 1850. And in this, this area, this larger region here, the largest earthquake going back to 1850 was a magnitude four in 1908. Um, we've, they, the Blundell power plant sits on the east side of an Opal Mound fault, and it's a naturally circulating um, power plant. It's where these pink dots are, and that seismicity associated with that power plant. When they were putting that in back in the mid 80s, they captured a swarm. George Zant um, was doing them some monitoring there. And that swarm comes out further to the east. We call this the Mineral Mountain Swarm Zone. Um, my postdoc, Maria Mezumeri, has a really nice paper on that swarm zone. So we have natural seismicity in the area. But until we start at Forge, these pink dots here are sort of associated to, with some stuff we've done out at Forge. There was no seismicity out on the west side of the Opal Mound Fault. So this was an area where we didn't have seismic activity. And even in the larger region, the seismic activity is low rates and low magnitudes. So as we were working on putting this together, we've been monitoring with a local network um, it's evolved through time. So the map I showed you is the current um, network. And on the top, you can just see the magnitudes with time. And you see that we have really low rates. So going back to 2016, we have just over 1,300 earthquakes going from magnitudes of minus one to just over two and a half. So low magnitudes, low rates. Okay, so this is a pretty good place, or at least we think so for what we know about induced earthquakes. We've done extensive um, characterization. We don't know of any large faults that are out there. I'm not saying we know what's in the granite for, for sure, but we don't see any signs of that. And we don't have large earthquakes. So with that, we put together a traffic light system that's very conservative, okay, in my mind. The closest town is Milford. It's 15 kilometers away. It's got 1,500 people, give or take. And what we have is our amber is a magnitude larger than two within this red box. So at the, at the three kilometer stage, if we get a magnitude two or larger event, John has to shut things down, okay? We have to investigate what's happening on site. And that was largely because until Forge, that whole area did not have earthquakes at all. So a magnitude two is an unusual event there. If we get, 10 or more magnitude ones or larger within a 24 hour window from the Gutenberg Richter law, we know that we're getting closer to getting a magnitude two. So we'll also shut things down and try and get ahead of things. This is so we can change things happening on site to mitigate um, seismic risk. And then if we start to see a uh, loss of drilling, this last one comes in in the Pohang experiment, they lost uh, their, in their drilling, they um, drilled into a fault and lost a lot of mud and, and didn't really characterize that as, as when they went through. And that was one of the things that was called out in the post-seismic um, studies. Okay. This is one I get questions about. At 15 kilometers from Forge, if we get a magnitude three or larger event, we'll shut down. We'll flow back and we'll step back. And for my mind, this is ultra conservative and, and I get that, um, but I've also been told we have to deal with sort of the fallout of this, the public side of this. A magnitude three is not gonna cause damage out there and we're minimizing against the possibility of a magnitude four and even where we're located, a magnitude four is not really gonna cause any damage. And I, I'm saying this with some confidence 
about three years ago, about 15 kilometers south of the town of Milford, we had about a 3.8. I think we had 26 felt reports or something like that from the town of Milford, okay? We get earthquakes in Utah, people feel them. They don't happen all the time, but it's not uncommon. So I know this is really conservative, but we wanna make sure we can continue to operate. Okay. So seismic monitoring on the reservoir scale, this has been really exciting for me and a little bit daunting, okay? Each one of these wells that John talked about, right? We we put an M at the end of the, do, you know, the dollar sign, a number, and an M. In seismic monitoring, we're still in like the tens of thousands at times, okay? I can go, I can put in one of those surface stations. I can buy the equipment for that for about $25,000, $30,000. I can telemeter that data in real time. I might have a telemetry cost, but we're talking completely different orders, different um, magnitude to scale here. So um, I'll talk about these wells, but my particular research interest in Forge's mission is it says we need to make um, commercial, we wanna make, we're doing the research so it's commercially viable to get to EGS. And when we're drilling, we have um, four deep monitoring wells that are going down, um, you know, to, over 3,000 feet, this is the shallowest one, 7832, and then we have three wells that are going down seven over 7,500 feet into 9,500 feet, so the reservoir depths. So tens of millions of dollars, at least tens of millions of dollars of investment there, um, and lots of instrumentation. And then when we want to monitor these seismically, we've got to pay people to come in and do this for us. So maybe I'm... I, thinking too small, but for my world, this is a lot of money and is not really commercially viable. So things we're working on are, how do we design networks to get to questions that people are interested in that might be more economical? So just to back up, um, 5832 is the first well drilled. We have DAS and 7832 to depth. 78B, we have DAS to about 3,700 feet. Um, we had some problems getting the DAS installed in 78B, and we had hoped to have DAS in 5632, and um, that cable broke at a very shallow depth. And then, as John just mentioned in the new production well, and I got to get his new figure here, we have DAS in the horizontal component. So we've done three um, different tests out here. In 2019, we stimulated in um, 5832, and I don't have time to talk about that. I'll talk a little bit more about the stimulation in 2022 that uh, John talked about, and then the circulation test we just did. I have some hot off the press um, figure from my current postdoc. So this is work largely done by GeoEnergy Swiss, who did the uh, real-time monitoring. Um, Giza Peterson um, was my postdoc at the time, and she was leading our efforts. Okay, John talked about temperatures and tools. Seismometers don't like hot temperatures. So um, we had a great plan. We were gonna put strings down at reservoir depths in the three deep holes. We had the DAS in, the, in 78B. Um, we had um, another tool that I'll, I'll describe in more detail in a minute. We spec'd out all this equipment. We spec'd out all the temperature. Everything met the specifications for the temperatures, at least as given to us by the vendors. In addition to the geophone strings, we, in 78B, we were gonna use the DAS and we were testing this new Avalon BOSS. Um, this is a three component fiber optic uh, geophone and it connects to wireline DAS. So we had a pretty extensive monitoring plan at the time, utilizing all that we have. And while I want to go to different networks, having this state-of-the-art network allows us to go to different monitoring schemes because we have catalogs earthquake catalogs we can compare to, so we can actually see what we can do. In the end, we weren't able to get any of the geophone strings to reservoir depths. For the first stage, um, we were able to get a string into 58, but they pulled that up to shallow, uh, more shallow depths, uh, lower temperatures. We had the DAS for all three stages, DAS and 78A and 78B, and the BOSS tool in 78A. For the second stage, um, we had some other tools on 
on site that we were going to use for post stimulating. These were analog tools. Um, and we couldn't get the strings to work, so we dropped those to reservoir depth in 56. These were tools that we were going to have operational after the stimulation for a few months or so we thought. Those tools lasted four days past stage three before they died. Stage three, we had learned our lesson. 58, the string in 58 continued to work. Those tools in 56 were continuing to work at the time, and we put the string in 78 at a shallower depth. Geoenergy Swiss did an amazing job of pulling in data from Avalon, Schlumberger, um, the DAS systems, integrating the timestamps across Forge, and merging all this data, which is was pretty remarkable in my time in my mind. Uh, just getting the timing to work across all across this wide area with all the different um, vendors. So a lot of work has been going into these different tools. Um, October of last year, we tried to test new versions of these tools and cable and cable heads. They operated for two days, just enough time for me to show, yes, it works. And then it's, then they died. Um, we're going out in a couple of weeks and we're going to try again. So Geoenergy Swiss is coming back in October and we're going to try some more with these um, PSS tools. As John mentioned, we got a remarkable catalog. We were also given a remarkable challenge because John told us we had to locate these with such precision that he could drive his, his new well into them, right? So I think we did a pretty good job. Um, and, you know, we see this, we're looking in cross section and the variation you see between stage one, stage two, and stage three can largely be attributed to the difference in the seismic networks. And especially when you look at map view, you can see that stage three is very well located. And that's largely a function of having three operational boreholes or monitoring in boreholes. 10 minutes, okay, thanks. All right, so we were doing that with the boreholes um, and some just incredible work. And if you're interested in those catalogs, um, Geoenergy Swiss has continued to work on those. They're at the International Seismological Commission's um, website, and they have what we've been showing are just events they can locate. They have many more events that they can get magnitudes for as well. So you can look at things like B values and actually do statistics. So now we have this amazing catalog that we can compare to. So we can go back and look at their locations. We can look at their magnitudes. We can look at the number of events they can detect. We can use their locations as the gold standard for where the events actually are. And now we can start to see if we can put together different seismic networks that might not cost tens of millions of dollars um, to get to the same level. So this is where we've been exploring different options. So uh, Giza Peterson, who was my postdoc at the time, uh, together with students um, and researchers went out to forge and we deployed uh, three component Fairfield nodal geophones. They're about the size of a bread box. We've done various, um, we've put these out over forge in rectangular grids. We put them out in circular grids. And this time we tried a patch network. So we're at the surface. We have to deal with all the uh, seismic energy coming through the sediments, okay? Geoenergy Swiss has it easy sometimes. I tease Ben because he just gets to work with things traveling through granite. So one velocity, right? We get all the complicated um, signals. It comes to the surface. Um, so what we were trying to do was design an array so that we could amplify the signal. So we wanted to use array processing and math to get there. So what we did is we, we have about 210, 215 nodes here at the University of Utah. We put them out in um 13 patches of 16 16 nodes each the nodes were separated by 30 meters and our idea was to stack this data and um since i don't have i think there's a back button here and it worked what we thought pretty well right here's a, a magnitude 0 0.5 on one of our nodes you can see the individuals the traces from the individual nodes and the stacked node this one was quite re re well recorded on the surface anyway, but if we go down to a minus 0 0.4, you can start to see um, these wiggles come out that are, we're more interested in. 
So I'm going to go back for a minute. It looked good until we started. One of the reasons we wanted to do this is we want to know what the source mechanism is. And so one way to get at source mechanism is to have sensors that sort of surround your um, events where you can actually look at waveforms or you can look at first motions. And so we were hoping that, you know, with this patch, we were surrounding the stimulation zone and we'd be able to get good focal mechanisms. So we started looking into that and the student I was having look at that couldn't get clear P arrivals, even on the stacked traces. So um, Giza and my new postdoc Peter started looking at this in more detail because the stacking wasn't lo looking quite like what we had hoped. And what they found was two things. Peter actually went through and did a noise analysis on every node in the field. And even over these small distances at Forge, which is quite windy, and there's a little bit of topography in places, the noise field um, from one end of the patch to the other changes in a consistent manner. So we don't have consistent, well, with noise, you want it to be incoherent, right? You want it to stack incoherently. But when we have noise that's this consistent across, when you start stacking this, you, you get this coherent stack. And on top of this, with the 30 meter spacing, what we found was um, our duration between the P and S waves are so short because these are such small events. Um, the P and the S, you, you would have to do separate stacks for P and S waves. And so um, in July, we went out and we've tested a number of different um, dimensions now and um, looked at where we had a noise, noisy patch and a quiet patch and sort of looked at the site characteristics. So we're redesigning our um, patches to go out in the future. And I think the concept is really good, right? For some of these cases, the larger events, it looks quite good. And if we run detectors across this, we can still see the events and we can build a catalog. It's just not what we were hoping to get. So um, that's some work we're doing um, in terms of improving the array configurations. Okay. Lastly, this is hot off the, the press. Uh, this is Peter Nimps. He's my current postdoc. Um, we didn't do anything special for the circulation test um, that we just ran. We've done fits in the past. We haven't really seen any seismic seismicity. We um, didn't have our nodes to go out. It was it was kind of a busy summer while they were doing that. So what I asked Peter to do was just use our local network. So the network we use for hazard, this network that's you know shallow holes like 100 to 150 feet, together with FORK, which is our thousand foot borehole. And I just said, we don't have anything, so create a detector, run it through the drilling, and let's see what we can do. So with the four closest stations here, FORK, FSB2, FSB3, and FOR2, he ran a waveform-based uh, coherence uh, detector. And um, I'm just showing the circulation tests at this point in time. And um, the Orange is the wellhead pressure. The blue is the flow rate. This red curve here is his cumulative uh, seismic moment. All of his magnitudes are relative to the GeoEnergy Swiss catalog from 2022. And you can see, you know, they started the circulation test. There's a delay and we start to see seismic activity. That's the blue dots here. Nothing's happening. If there's seismic activity, it's below our threshold with this method. They start again and we see events happening again. Some you know, initial interesting observations is our largest magnitude in 2022 was a 0.5. Our largest magnitude from this circulation was about a 0.5. So we're getting about the same um, magnitude range here. We're working on locations. And um, since this worked here, Peter's gone back and has run the same detector with the same stations against the 2022 stimulation. So we'll be able to look at how well we can locate these events. And we're also hoping to incorporate some of the data from the 16B DAS installation to further refine locations. So why we, while, why we are doing this, right, is maybe if you have DAS and some surface instruments, that might be all you need. And the DAS in the, the well gives you a lot of additional information than just seismic. 
So this is kind of where we're headed um, with my group and our research is how do we develop better networks to get to the questions that are being asked in what might be a more commercially viable way. So what's next? Um, as John mentioned, we're talking about multi-stage stimulations. Um, our plan will have the local seismic network. We have the DAS in 16B, 7832 and 78B32. Those will be monitored as part of um, the research projects. Um, although we are trying to get um, access to the 16B DAS as well, and we'll include that into operations for the real-time catalog. We have the GEA change in 78B and 58, 32, and we're just gonna stop at 150 degrees C. We're, we're just not gonna tempt fate this year, okay? This is, we're, we have some confidence here that it cables and this, the, the geophone temperatures, they'll work. Um, we're gonna put this FOSS tool in 5632. Um, they've been revamping it and retesting it. It's connected to a DAS wire line. And if that all works out, that will come out and go into 5632. If not, we're gonna use these PSS tools. Everyone's fingers are crossed that they pass our tests in October and we can actually get them working at 150 degrees C. If it's the boss tool can go to deeper, um, higher temperatures, but all the geophones were stopping at 150. We'll put out um, a surface geophone array that we're redesigning with the patch network. University of Colorado wants to bring in some surface DAS and we had surface DAS out in 2022 and they're getting some interesting results out there. Our particular research objectives are integrating the seismic data from different sources mapping of reservoir fracture systems and um, the deep project, which is um, coming out of Europe led by ETH, they're gonna come over and test an adaptive traffic light system. So they integrate the pumping history on site with modeling and risk characteristics. Um, and that's where we're going with seismic monitoring. And I too wanna thank DOE and all our many stakeholders. And I probably. Okay, we'll get started. Our next speaker, I would like to welcome Emma McConville. She's the development <clears throat> geoscience lead at uh, Purvo Energy. Emma McConville has a wealth of experience in geoscience and related fields. In 2021, Emma began working as the development geoscience lead and development geoscience ge geologist for Purbo Energy. From 2018 to 2021, they held the role of senior geologist at ExxonMobil, where they led and collaborated well planning and execution efforts for 14 successful deep water horizontal wells for DISA phase one development. Please welcome Emma McConnell. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much for having me, EGI. Um, you know, we've done a lot of collaboration and um, the FORGE project has been very instrumental in helping Provo develop our technology and, you know, really excited to see this partnership move forward. So here's the agenda. I'm gonna try to get through it uh, all. So I'll give you a brief overview of what our technology is. I'll go into our commercial pilot project called Project Red based out of Winnemucca. And then I'll go into our current project, our greenfield development um, near Forge, which we call our CAPE project. And time permitting, I may talk a little bit about our Fervo Flex technology, kind of leveraging um, the, our reservoirs um, as a battery to complement some of the intermittent power sources. Um, out there. Okay, so Fervo Energy really has taken a lot from the shale revolution um, over the past 20 years, leveraging horizontal drilling to be able to contact more of the reservoir, um, using multi-stage completion designs, limited entry designs um, to increase the amount of fractures um, between our wells. And then we really heavily rely upon fiber optics as a way to understand our fracture morphology, our connection to our um, completion design efficiencies as well. 
So here's a schematic of, we use ResFrac as our main reservoir modeling software where we have either injectors and producers staggered in a wine rack configuration. And the idea is that we can circulate fluid through the subsurface. And I'm happy to say that we've been successful at doing that today. Um, so this is always an, an exciting site. I'm a geologist, but um, it, our uh, founders, Jack and Tim, you know, have been thinking about this moment for over five years where you actually start to see steam coming out of the ground. Um, and so to give you an idea, um, we drilled three wells in this field um, and we were, I'll show you a schematic of what the cross section looks like, but we had a 37 day cross flow test where we tested different flow rates, um, curtailing some of the production uh, within our reservoir. And I'll show that as well. And I'm happy to say, you know, these are our support beams for our pipelines. They've been fully built and we are actually commissioning our two sets of wells um, to feed into a power plant that is currently underperforming. So what we're providing here is additional temperature um, so that they can decrease their flow rate, take some of their least less productive wells offline and meet their PPA requirements. And feel free to ask questions if, if any come up in the meantime. So here's a, a schematic of what our system looks like um, at Blue Mountain. We first drilled our 7322 monitoring well. Um, that well really was meant to de-risk the temperature as well as any potential faults within um, the area. So we always wanna know, you know where some of our, kind of our lost circulation zones are gonna be so we can actively avoid them. So similar to conventional, we wanna have a good understanding of the subsurface. That way we can proactively manage it um, for our, our reservoir designs. Um, that well was fully instrumented with fiber optics, DAS and DTS, as well as the downhold temperature and pressure gauge. Um, our reservoir temperatures are about 375 degree F. Um, that was our target. And we actually saw that um, during our cross flow test as well. Then we drilled um, the first, our injector well, which is the first um, lateral well drilled for geothermal in this formation. And I'll say that this formation is a phyllite, so a meta sedimentary formation that has been heavily intruded by um, dikes. And that's what you can see here in the blue. So kind of hard to map in the subsurface, a series of dikes. But really the takeaway is our geology here is we're going from phyllites, which are similar to shales, to um, these harder, um, anywhere from diorite to granodiorite dikes that are um, quite different. So. One of the questions we had when we started seeing this high variation in our, our wells was, you know, is this going to affect our, our stimulation design? How is this, how is the system going to perform when we originally thought it was going to be more of a consistent fillet? Um, so a couple other things to note, um, we drilled a 10 degree dog leg, which is from my previous experience, we didn't drill such severe dog legs and, um, and we were successfully able to run uh, fiber optics through the dog leg on the injector to TD successfully. Um, you know, our hole size was nine and seven eighths. Uh, our casing is seven inch, so a bit larger than what you see in unconventional, but that's important because we need high flow rates. Um, we stimulated uh, the injector, used the fiber optics um, to understand our completion um, design and which uh, clusters were taking fluids, as well as trying to locate microseismic events uh, between the monitoring well DAS and the injector uh, DAS as well. Once we stimulated that well, we drilled the production well. You'll see that there's an interesting geometry here. So initially, we were just going to vertically offset the well, but after the stimulation and the data that we got from microseismic, we saw that the cloud was actually quite larger, more laterally extensive. And so we directionally drilled um, the producer about 200 feet above the injector um, at the heel and about 450 degrees to the north. Um, and while we were drilling this well, we also, uh, you know, we do a lot of mud logging and we were on the hunt for propent. So we did see some propent shows um, 
as we were drilling the producer. Uh, we ran fiber optics successfully in the producer as well. Um, and we stimulated the producer. Unfortunately, after stage three, we had parted casing at the heel, which resulted in running a five inch string all the way back to surface. So lost a lot of our, our fiber that, that's hugely valuable, but also um, we are fortunate to be able to complete the well. Um, but what I'll show you in terms of some of our flow results, you'll see that um, we're looking at a five inch um, string to surface. So, and then we, we actually went back and we cut the five inch. So now we're actually expecting um, our production rates to go up due to the increased um, borehole or yeah, the increased diameter of the well. Here's a schematic of all the wells that were drilled in the field prior to Furbo. Um, and so our the yellow line here, that's our monitoring well. The green line is our first uh, lateral or injector. And the blue line is our producer that we drilled subsequently. And so we achieved a top quartile drilling speeds relative to other wells across the field. And these are also the deepest wells in the field. Uh, we also had quite complex well construction. So you can imagine a first of a kind, you wanna be pretty conservative in order to ensure success. So um, I think our, our heel was, or yeah, like our curve was 13 and three quarter uh, inch hole. So large hole um, for, for drilling um, these curves and such. So, and then we also primarily drilled uh, with PDC bits, especially in the basement, um, but used uh, roller cones in the alluvium and at times through the curve section where we were experiencing some challenges, um, but really leveraged exist existing technology um, that's out there um, in the oil field. Um, so standard motors with bent sub for directional drilling. Um, and more recently, we've tried out some rotary steerables at at our project Cape. Um, but what's really important from a commercial standpoint is how do you actually move to, like to decreasing the amount of days that you're, it takes to drill these wells. So for us, there's well construction and drilling is a large part of uh, our capital expenditure early on and anything that we can do to reduce that is really valuable. Okay, so there are a lot of questions as to whether we could stimulate um, in these formations. Uh, in the injection well, we had um, 16 stages, all of which took fluid, um, 20 stages in the production well. On average, we had a 30 foot cluster spacing with six clusters per stage, uh, 180 uh, foot stage length. We did try 10 clusters and some of our um, stimulation designs, uh, you know, we, Pretty much use the standard prop in, uh, materials and pretty typical from what I understand. I'm not a completions engineer, um, but a, a pretty standard um, completion design, uh, about 5, 000, um, 500,000 pounds of prop in per stage. Um, and that is uh, quartz prop in. Uh, we tried a 40, 70 mesh and a hundred mesh prop in um, and a hundred barrels per minute target pump rate. Um, so happy to say that we were able to um, initiate fractures at all of our clusters is, um, is what we found so far. So over 100 fractures, um, which is great news for us because that's 100 flow paths that we can measure at the well bore. Um, we achieved industry standard rate volumes, propent loading concentrations um, while treating stages in meta sedimentary and granitic lithology. So you know, maybe we didn't want to have a lot of granite. We wanted to use a lot of, well, we wanted to leverage the shale, um, the light um, geology, but it really helped de-risk what we're doing now and what Forge is uh, like, you know, similar geology to what Forge is, is working in right now. Um, our in-well DAS um, treatment confirmed that our clusters um, were taking fluid and we could initiate those Fractures, we also had um, really good plug integrity and isolation integrity between our stages, as you can see in the DAS, uh, where there isn't any breakthrough with our, our temperature. And then we were also uh, 
what we found to be hugely valuable was the monitoring well um, that where we could leverage the DAS low frequency response, um, which helps us understand the fracture height and um, of like the fracture height as well as the distance um, of our fractures. It's not always a direct measurement, um, but it can give us a, a minimum there. So what you're seeing here is um, like the measured depth of the monitoring well. Um, your blues are gonna be like compression, your red is gonna be extension. And so what we're seeing here over time is during the stimulation, you see your fracture opening, then you have a pretty consistent fracture height, and then you see your fracture close, which is where it goes into compression in blue again. Um, and we're expecting to let, we're gonna use the same type of analysis um, at our CAPE project. Um, we also monitored with microseismic, mostly with um, our fiber optics, um, our DAS fibers, um, we, similar to Forge. We used Avalon um, and found that we we couldn't um, leverage the geophones like we had hoped. And what we see here is that we have a quite large stimulated rock volume, or about three thousand um, feet by sixteen hundred feet by a thousand feet. And we input this data into uh, our geologic models and then into our reservoir models to come up with a heat in place estimate. And uh, Steve Burko published a paper at the Stanford workshop, if anyone's interested in, in reading that. Um, so another thing I'll mention is, you know, you look at this and perhaps you say like, why didn't we put the wells farther apart? And really our aim at Fervo was to ensure that we had connection between the wells, right? This is the first step in figuring out how to optimize well spacing. Um, and I'll show you some of the cross flow test results here. Um, so we expect that we have about 3.5 megawatts with our current system in place. Um, here at the top, we have our injection well head pressures in, uh, in black and in blue, we have our injection rates. Um, and here at the bottom, we have our production well head pressures and our uh, production rates. Uh, we did several different types of tests over the 37 days. Uh, we conducted just a typical cross flow test early on, and then we did a long-term tracer, a 30-day tracer test. Um, and so what you can see is that we were able to, oh, come on. Yeah. Um, inject, connect our wells, um, and we had sustained flow rates of 25 um, to 30,000 barrels per day. Uh, for reference, our current target for our production wells is about 68,000 barrels per day. So uh, we're trying to double uh, this, this amount. And our lateral length are about 3,200 feet long. So right now we're looking at expanding that to 5,000 feet um, and increasing our well spacing to allow for, for more heat sweep through this, uh, through our reservoirs. Okay. So thinking about our fracture connectivities, this is really one of the main questions that we have. Uh, we're worried about, you know, our well head pressures. How do you make sure that you can inject, lower that parasitic load? And what we found is that we see about 150 PSI pressure drop across the reservoir when we're flowing at 15,000 barrels per day. Um, like I said, we had at least 100 discrete fracture flow zones. Um, and this suggests that our fracture connectivities are between 300 and 400 uh, milladarcy feet. So this is like or orders of magnitude to four times as as large as some of the fracture connectivities that we see in shales. The other uh, data that we collected um, was spinner log data. And there is a big question about whether there is gonna be heel bias between these wells. And um, when we ran the spinner log, we did it also on uh, wireline fiber um, to do some heat back analyses as well. Um, and what you can see here, this is our, like essentially how much each stage 
took uh, in terms of flow rate. And it's not perfectly uniform, uh, but but you can see is that there isn't a heel bias per se, and that there is some heterogeneity in flow rates. But even at the toe, we are seeing flow um, from the injector going into the reservoir. Okay, very similar, to, very important induced seismicity mitigation, right? This is our license to operate as a, as a developer. And we've worked closely with the USGS to have live data go to them um, in order to monitor the background seismicity before we started any drilling um, or stimulation or production. Um, and we installed a surface seismic array here as well with eight broadband seismometers and two strong motion sensors. Um, this data is publicly available um, and what we found is that with our ISMP, um, we didn't exceed uh, the green zone, which is great news for us. Um, and I think very promising for, for hopefully what, what comes at CAPE as well. Um, so what you see here are, I believe here's where we started drilling. This is where our stimulations began, and this is our cross flow test. Um, so great news uh, on the induced seismicity front um, from our, our side. Okay, so this is what we've done to date. We have a four well appraisal campaign, which consists of our Delano well and our Frisco well in Forge is right here. And we wanted to be close to where there was ex existing data and leverage that as best as possible. Um, and so, we first drilled the Delano one well uh, to 9647 feet. Uh, bottom hole temperature is 444F. And um, we also ran a full suite of logs. So we used um, the litho scanner to understand the geology. It's kind of like a analog to core, but not core is pretty expensive. It's hard to convince um, a company sometimes to, to run core. Um, so we do the best that we can with the other geophysical data sets that we can. What we've seen is actually, as you move from uh, east to west, is that there's a slight rotation to a more northerly um, HS max orientation, uh, which is favorable to our well, um, our well trajectories to link up these wells. Um, you know, Delano also has permanent fiber instrumented as well as an ERD pressure temperature gauge, um, to, which we've found to be very valuable in monitoring the system over time, understanding how pressure depletes um, within our system once we do our cross flow test, as well as um, post stimulation. Um, then we drilled the Frisco 1i well, and uh, we ran through bit logs. Um, all the way, like we, we logged the vertical section as well as the lateral section, had successful data collection there, which is awesome. One, one thing we've done uh, to help, um, you know, reduce our circulating times, we've, act, we, we've been circulating to cool off the well at once at TD at about a, a thousand barrels per minute. Um, and we have a series of mud coolers on surface to help with that. Um, happy to say we haven't, any of the through bit logging tools. Um, it gets a little nerve wracking when you're out there. Uh, our reservoir, our target reservoir temperatures here are about 200 C, 392F, and that's like mid lateral. Um, so you can imagine the toes of these wells are a bit hotter uh, given the convective uh, resource just to uh, the east. And perhaps the most, like the biggest news uh, hot off the press here is, um, you know, these are our Blue Mountain wells that we drilled and right here in red, uh, that's our first, our Delano well. We drilled it in 17 days um, compared to 41 days at Project Red. Granted, our design was uh, pared down. Uh, we had um, like, a, a, like a surface section and pretty much a production section all the way uh, to the bottom. I'm also happy to say that this western fault zone, which exists more to the south 
Um, but as a geologist, I'm always concerned with where these faults are and if we can glean any insight. Um, we, we didn't see uh, anything that suggests there's a fault in that area, which is also good for our uh, seismicity uh, monitoring. And then uh, we just finished, like I said, uh, Frisco 1i. We drilled that in, uh, is that the, I think it's 37 days. Um, and we're in the process of drilling uh, the 2P uh, lateral section. And one other thing from the um, drilling side that, that we're leveraging is batch drilling. Um, so we're drilling intermediate sections, of, well, First, we're drilling the whole well um, as we step out from where we have well control to make sure that we're not drilling a bunch of intermediate sections where we may not be able to complete the well. Um, but for all the subsequent wells, we're going to be doing batch drilling, um, and that should really help with some of the drilling efficiencies. Um, so we've actually come down our learning curve um, on the drilling on our like, days versus depth, um, which is helping our economics um, significantly. You can imagine a day rate on, on the rig is not cheap. Um, so really what we're trying to do here is how do we get to a scalable development, right? And there are a couple ways to do this. One is increasing your lateral length, um, your flow capacity, heat transfer through the reservoir. There are some challenges with going to 10,000 feet that we're evaluating. Um, the longer the lateral, the what we've seen is the lower rate of thermal decline. And so trying to optimize you know, your flow rates, your thermal decline when you start drilling additional wells. Of course, drilling a well in five, seven, 10 years as an infill or support well is gonna be cheaper than drilling a well today. And so trying to figure out the economics of kind of what, what that landscape looks like. Also increasing um, your surface and intermediate casing diameters. Um, the larger the well bore, um, the less friction, um, the higher the flow rate. And um, for these wells, we decided to do, um, I'm gonna, it's gonna, I'm gonna blank on this, but we have a liner with, um, not a driller, but pretty much we have, uh, 10 and three quarter inch um, with a liner coming out of the bottom. And then you can attach like a pipe. What is it called? A tie back, a tie back string. Yes. I'm like, what is the word? A tie back string for the stimulation. And then we can remove the tie back string and help support our production. Um, and then there's this whole question about how are we going to optimize our completion design? Um, and that's where you know, we really view permanent fiber as um, the key to understanding that. We're also evaluating uh, nano tracers for different stages. Um, and of course, we're going to be history matching our, our cross flow test results and doing everything we can to kind of figure out the secret sauce. That way we can standardize as quickly as possible. Um, and I think the geometries of what we can do in terms of well design. Um, you know, we're still in the early stages, but really willing to test, um, you know, uh, different designs and opportunities that are high value, even though they might be a little high risk today. So one thing we're doing at Frisco, uh, on the Frisco pad is we're adding a fourth well, a producer, we're gonna do an unstimulated producer test. Um, we're still figuring out exactly what that well spacing is gonna be, but you can imagine, um, Saving on completions is going to be about half your well cost, so another way of driving down uh, those costs. How much time do I? Zero? Yeah. <laughs> no questions. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You take questions now. Okay, perfect. Sorry about that. That one is um, outside of Winnemucca, so at, right near the Blue Mountain uh, facility. Mm -hmm. 
Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Pengju Zing. He's a research associate at EGI. He has expertise on enhancing energy extraction from subsurface with engineering treatment, including geothermal, unconventional resources, et cetera. He has over eight years experience in geomechanics, both in industry and academics, numerical simulations and experiments. As you uh, heard before, uh, the big news on Forge was that they were able to demonstrate interval connectivity and uh, Dr. Jing will talk about that. Thank you. Thanks, Menon. <clears throat> Okay, yeah. So uh, John uh, talked about uh, so the advanced in forge. So here I'll talk about uh, the the circulation test we have uh, we have done um, in July this year. Uh, so yeah, I'll br briefly give you some uh, background on this uh, on the forge project. Uh, what we have done briefly. So uh, first in uh, December twenty twenty, we completed drilling of the uh, injection well, 16A, 70A32. Uh, after that, we conducted a three stage stimulation um, in the near total well, 16A in April uh, 2022. And then we uh, completed drilling the production well, 16B, uh, into the seismic cloud of the stimulation in 2023, June. And right after that, we conducted a circulation test. And with them, the yes, show, the demonstrate we demonstrate the connection between the injection well and the production well. Uh, so before I go uh, uh, go into the circuit test, I talk about the stimulation test, the uh, hydraulic stimulation we have done because our connection is based on the uh, fraction network generated by these uh, stimulations. So these are three uh, three stages of stimulation. And uh, at near the toe of the of the uh, 16A, so this green line is the 16A, and uh, the first stage is the uh, open hole, the 200 open hole at the toe of the 16A, and the stage two and stage three they are in the case section and the perforated. So for the the pumping rate is from 35 to uh, 50 barrel per minute. And the volume is like between 3,000 to 4,000 barrels each stage. And so the difference between the stage two and stage three that uh, stage three we use cresting channel and which uh, higher viscosity and uh, use uh, some, uh, some uh, micropropylene in stage three. And here's the, uh, you see this picture several times, here's the micro seismic clouds uh, generated, uh, detected during the stimulation. Um, and so we see that stage three has a, you know, where it's uh, like planar fracture. Uh, so yeah, so it's about 10,000 uh, barrels in jack total uh, during stimulation. And we believe it's created fracture network uh, combined of uh, the newly created fracture and the mesh fracture. And then we drill the, you know, 16B into this micro seismic cloud. Um, then so the, so the purpose then the purpose of the, the circuit test, we want to demonstrate the connection between uh, this uh, 16 and 6B. And uh, so I'll show you later. Uh, here is more uh, some sketch of these uh, circuit tests. So basically, we have two uh, circuit tests, uh, test one, test two. So the major difference is that uh, in the test, circuit test one, so the 16B, they are open hole. So, and then uh, we put a uh, casing uh, into 16B, but still leave a 700 feet uh, open hole. So uh, this uh, uh, fracture represents the, the fracture network uh, for the three stages. And then we inject cold, cold water in the 16A. And this, uh, we expect them, them circulate through the fracture network and come back from 16B. And uh, <clears throat> The pumping rate is uh, the maximum is five barrel to 7.5 barrel per minute. As it's smaller compared to the hydro estimation, that is maximum 50 barrel per minute. And the volume uh, is from uh, 3,000 to 4,000 barrels, similar to each stage of the hydro estimation, but with, uh, you know, it's a smaller rate. 
And the surface pressure is uh, around uh, 4,500 PSI. So this is uh, the pressure of the suction test one. So the blue one is uh, uh, pressure of 16, uh, 16A and orange one is uh, uh, pressure 16B uh, <clears throat> production well. So we can see that uh, here we start injection and then we see the, the curve change of the pressure. Uh, that means something happened to the, to the red wall, either uh, create a new fracture or reopen a previous fracture. And then uh, about uh, 40 minutes later, uh, later, we see the pressure rise in 16B. That is, means the connection between the 16 and 16B. And we keep uh, injecting from uh, 16A and we keep uh, 200 PSI back pressure at 16B and then 100 PSI back pressure. And here we uh, shut in uh, stone pumping and also close the floating wall uh, of the 16B and the pressure gradually build up in 16B overnight. The next day, uh, start uh, injection again. Uh, and then only five minutes later, uh, we see the pressure rise in 16B. So very uh, quick uh, response in 16B. And keep uh, 200 PSI back pressure 16B and stone pumping, uh, do some cycling and stone pumping in 16A and close the valve in 16B. You see the pressure rise again uh, in 16B. So a summary of that, uh, we see, do see uh, the pressure response in 16 meters. That is shows the connection. And the response time, like first is 40 minutes because we need to uh, reopen the structure then, but then later, then the, in the second day, it's only like five minutes, then we see the, the response. Okay, so here's more of the data. Uh, here's show the, uh, pressure and uh, also the pumping rate uh, for the two days. And we can see that the wellhead pressure uh, is ab about 4,500 PSI uh, uh, or reopening. And for the second day it's reduced uh, to the 4,200 PSI. But these pressure are all above the, the minimum uh, horn institute stress because as, uh, according to our, our experience previously, so, uh, the fracturing pressure should be 3,000 PSI at surface, but now we are about that. We, it means that we are reopening the, the fracture and also there's maybe some new uh, propagation of the fractures. Um, so, and then we compare these two days, we see that the reopening or reinitiating pressure of the second day is smaller and also the shut-in pressure uh, you see here is it's higher because there's uh, after the first day pumping there's some fluid in the reservoir uh, to give you a higher uh, shutting pressure uh, and also the response pressure in the 60B is higher and here is a production uh, production rate uh, as you see the dot uh, from 16B. Uh, just that means we see the fluid come out from 16B while we are injecting uh, in 16A. Uh, this the production rate is uh, from around like from five to fifteen uh, barrel per hour. Uh, that is that is quite low. Uh, it's not commercial, but uh, still uh, communication between two wells. Uh, and also we see the production rate increase as we uh, uh, pump into 16A. Uh, so this is the uh, suction test two, and after we put casing uh, in, 16, uh, in 16B. Um, and uh, so here, uh, is, we see the pressure uh, in 16A and 16B. Uh, here we see the, uh, the instantaneous response in 16B. So while we start injecting 16A, then we, Immediately we see the pressure change in 16B. Uh, and we compare these two days, uh, July 18, July 19. Uh, so for the July 19, 
you see the 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 pressure treatment pressure only four thousand psi is much much smaller than the first day. And also, we are uh, during the uh, suction test too. We also do some similar tests to test the flow distribution uh, along these three stages. So here are the results. Uh, so this uh, stage one, stage two, and stage three. And different color means the we because we change the rate at different uh, period of time. And uh, we know that it's uh, obvious that the stage one, stage three, uh, they take much more fluid than stage two. And uh, just to remind you that uh, stage one is open hole section, a uh, an open hole, and stage three is like uh, we use a crossing gel and with uh, micropropane. And stage two is like a uh, uh, case section, but with uh, 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 slick, wa uh, slick water. So here's a production rate. Uh, similar, the production rate is similar with uh, the circuit test one. Uh, but but I want to mention that uh, this is also we put a casing and so the 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 cre uh, fracture created in stage three and stage two they are maybe behind the casing so the fluid go in there but cannot come through uh, uh, through the production well and that's uh, uh, if you that takes about fifty percent of the flow as it is from the spinner test. And here, uh, I show some uh, stiffness change uh, of the red wall. So uh, the stiffness I mean here is the linear section, uh, the slope of linear section of the, this pressure water uh, injected volume uh, plot. So if nothing happened, a uh, change in the red wall, if you, you see the pressure with inject volume is be linear, then uh, if you keep inject, if the railroad damage either reopening pressure or create new fractures, reinitiate fractures, the curve will be will change. It can change the slope, and uh, so we compare linear section part, and we see the stiffness change. Uh, it, so the for the July 18th, July 19th, the stiffness is uh, reduced, especially the July 19th is only, I mean, a quarter of uh, previous uh, the circuit test one. That means. Uh, uh, we keep uh, uh, circulating uh, either uh, we so create a new fractures or something happened in the red wall and this uh, uh, we change the uh, stiffness is re reduced. Here I also compare the uh, fracture profile uh, same uh, pumping rate uh, it's uh, in circle. So five barrel per minute uh, for these four days of circulation. And we see that, uh, so especially for the last one, it's, uh, it's much different from first three because uh, the first three you see the, the fracture trend is the de uh, decline. It means that you have a fracture propagation or re reopening fracture. Uh, but <clears throat> last one is quite flat. Uh, and uh, also, this uh, it's a uh, treatment pressure is, is much lower. Uh, it's so one thing is suggest the lower uh, pumping pressure so is higher in, uh, conductivity. Also, the flash means you have a uh, uh, connected channel between the two wells. Uh, and the part of the reason could be like uh, so be before we we uh, the last day of the circulation, of July nineteenth, there. Are, uh, Four or five hours flow back from the from this, uh, the well sixteen a, uh, as could be uh, because of flow back, there's uh, the uh, uh, the particles like some uh, uh, participations that uh, in the fracture could be uh, flush out, so that will uh, might be might increase the conductivity. So conclusion, yes. So as we see the pressure response and also the uh, production from 16B, there is definitely the, the connection between these two wells. Uh, is uh, because of hydraulic stimulation we did uh, before. And also we know that the injection pressure is uh, above the minimal in stress. 
means you need to a lot of use a lot of house power to circulate. Uh, that that could be because even so you create a fracture during the stimulation like two years ago, but then the fracture are closed. Then you do the circulation, you want to reopen its fractures, still take a lot of effort. Because even we use some micropropent uh, in stage three, that's only a small amount. Uh, so uh, that suggests that like, uh, we might, um, so the propent uh, might be a prerequisite for the future treatments. So the problem will keep this pressure open. So you, in, the, in the circulation, you, you, like, you don't need as much horsepower. Like uh, what for for they in their uh, project they do uh, a lot of problems, uh, and also the the initial cycles the uh, first three days uh, three days circulation that she was like a pressure decline train that suggests fracture opening or potential fracture propagation. The last cycle like the fracture flat uh, flat train uh, that suggests the connect channel between two wells, and also. Uh, the communication can be improved is uh, sustain the injection into 16A uh, uh, because we see that this uh, trim pressure is reducing uh, and also the connector enhanced uh, as we continue more cycles of the injection. Uh, yeah, that's what I want to say. Seven. Go ahead and go back. Yeah. So uh, if you compare this, uh, so we separated by circuit one, circuit two. First, so uh, so we have two days. Each circuit in time we have two days, and so the second day is always less than the first day. Uh, that may be because because we inject the fluid in this uh, overnight, there's still fluid in, in the fracture. So that they keep the fresh open. So you, the second day, you don't need that much uh, effort to reopen in the fracture. And uh, in the suction test two, uh, so uh, as, we, I, as I talk, so we have hours flow back. So that might flush out this, uh, 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 Participation in uh, in the fractures, so that uh, uh, that's our uh, yeah. like uh, hypothesis. That's why the the pressure is much reduced and pressure uh, the, the pressure trend change so fast. Yeah. Let me I might be also some thermal effect uh, because you keep injecting the cooling water in. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay, we will talk about water rock interactions in the Utah Forge Reservoir. We'll start out with the reservoir rocks. Their mineral assemblage is pretty much the same across all the rock types with a few exceptions, even plutonic and metamorphic rocks. Really the only way to tell is large scale pictures. Luckily we have core showing some nice metamorphic textures here, some other plutonic rocks. Um, there's core out there if you'd like to take a look. These are very low porosity rocks. From the core measurements, we get porosity less than half a percent. Permeabilities are very low on the order of 50 microdarcies. And open fractures in the reservoir are not interconnected. Okay, we've had no loss or gain of fluid during drilling, at least within the EGS reservoir. There was a slight loss circulation zone a little bit higher in the broken up granite. And we have static water levels and unstimulated wells. You can fill these things up to the surface and the water won't drop down and the regional water table is about 500 feet down. So I think you're all more or less familiar with this kind of concept of what we've got going out there. But I just want to point out that we'll be talking a lot about the stimulation zone and the flow back from the stimulations because those are some of the few fluids that have been out and touched the reservoir and we've been able to collect and analyze. So you've seen a version of this before. We're looking now at the stimulation that happened in April, 2022. We're looking at barrels versus time. The injections are shown in colorful dotted lines. Different flowbacks are outlined at flowback lines here in blue. 
And we've got the sampling points there labeled by a percent of flow back. And as also has been to cover, uh, covered, but I think I wanna point out the uh, stages one and two were slick water and stage three was a viscosified fluid. So moving on. So we were all sort of floored when we got the geochemistry data back from the stimulation. This fluid had been the reservoir for 30 hours or less. Our fluid base was culinary grade water we purchased from the town of Milford, something you'd get out of the tap, something you'd want to drink. Um, when you look at these graphs now, we're looking at volume of flow back versus parts per million. And what's inside the gray box was fluid that was just in the well bore the whole time. Well bores four or 500 barrels in volume. So we were able to push that down in, but it never interacted with the rock and never came back. So that's more or less our baseline. So you see, we start with very low chlorine values and with time, it just skyrockets. And there is some difference between flowbacks stages one and two in blue and orange, which are the slick water and stage three, which was the viscosified fluid. So overall, the TDSs went from something that was a couple hundred parts per million to something that was thousands of parts per million. As you can see, some of the most drastic increases, well, the most drastic increase was in chloride, going from 51 to 4,600 parts per million, orders of magnitude increase. Also sodium, potassium, calcium, climatin. And just a quick back of the envelope calculation, we got about 5,000 kilograms of dissolved solids back with that flow back water. We're moving a lot of stuff in the subsurface. Okay, an exception to this is magnesium. So we've got our baseline up here, about 14 parts per million, and it actually declines with time. So magnesium is often depleted in geothermal reservoirs. It's easily incorporated into minerals like chloride. And we see quite a few magnesium bearing minerals filling fractures in the EGS reservoir. Okay, so we're interpreting this as a typical kind of water rock interaction like you'd see in a, in a given geothermal reservoir. So we'll take a quick look at some of the minerals that are in there. This is a uh, photomicrographs with thin section from about 8,000 feet and 16 AR injector well, where we hit a fracture zone. And this fracture zone is completely mineralized by these ROMs of carbonate, which are magnesium and iron bearing. And they're in a fine grained matrix of quartz. It looks a lot like a sedimentary dolomite texture, which you would not expect to find within a pluton. Here's some backscatter SEM images of the same fracture zone and some uh, EDS maps. And here's magnesium down here in red lighting up. We also get uh, clay minerals filling open space. So this is a piece of the 78B core. Might be hard to see, but adhering to the core, most of which fell off, unfortunately, but was collected, is a piece of microbrescia. Here's some photomicrographs of it. We got angular pieces of the wall rock, quartz feldspars, all encapsulated in a interlayered chloride smectite. And just in case there are any skeptics, you can see the clay size patterns there where that interlayered clay is swelling and collapsing and doing what it's supposed to do. Another version of the same thing. So you see the typical minerals, silica, aluminum. You know, blues and greens, those are the fragments of the wall rock, and it's all encapsulated in magnesium bearing stuff and a little bit of carbonate there. So within each stage, we injected a unique tracer. Okay, we're looking at the same flow back curves again. We got our target tracer concentration. And then the, and then in parts per, per excuse me per billion, the flow back. So in stage one, we're a little bit below, but it comes back at a pretty consistent level. Stage two, there's some untagged stuff in the well bore, which is crossed out here, which you can ignore. It gets at the targeted concentration, drops below. Stage three, kind of above and below. So we're in the range that we would expect. So if you compare tracer concentrations to chloride concentrations, you see that, which is this graph here, 
you can see that it's more or less a linear trend, maybe a little below the targeted concentration, but it doesn't show maybe what you would expect from mixing. If we were bringing in a chloride rich fluid, you would get an exaggerated version. Well, this is an exaggerated version, but you'd want to see something trending this way increasing chloride and decreasing tracers with time. So actually, let me go back. Okay, so where's this chlorine coming from? It's coming up pretty strongly in stages one and two with the slick water, not so much in the viscosified fluid. Where is it? Well, here's some photomicrographs of a, another clay-filled vein. This one shows evidence of at least three stages of mineralization. First stage is chloride and hematite, gets sheared out. Chloride smectite then precipitates. And finally, later on, is this illite smectite. And it turns out that illite smectite is underground with halite. So I looked and looked for it in thin sections, but guess what? You're cutting that rock with water, you're grinding and polishing with water, and they're tiny, okay? So I couldn't see it in the thin section SEM. Broke a core, I'm looking at a rough surface now. Here's a clay mineral with its C axis sub. You kind of see its hexagonal shape. There's some more fibrous stuff where it's on edge. And if you look really closely, you can start to see some cubic stuff. And it really pops out over on the elemental maps there. See the chlorine and sodium coming up in yellow and green. Here's another version of the same thing. Some of the colors swapped around, but still we got chlorine and sodium coming up in yellow and green. Lots of clay minerals on edge here. So we also conducted some very simple water rock interaction experiments. We ground up the rock, powdered it, want to get in all the little pore spaces, maybe even the fluid inclusions. See what was in there, see what we can leach out of it. We did it at different ratios. We used DI water, thoroughly mixed. It was just shaken up, let sit for 24 hours, decanted, centrifuged. What's in this water now? Well, sulfate and quite a bit of it. Not so much sodium or chlorine, but something sort of unexpected. We, were, we thought we were gonna get some salts out of here. So you can see it's variable by water rock ratio. That's kind of intuitive. It was kind of similar across rock types. We put plutonic rocks in there, metamorphic rocks. All of them gave us a sulfate back. So how, why? Well, it turns out that anhydrite is a widespread accessory mineral phase in all the lithologies within the, within the EGS reservoir. It's not in veins necessarily, although it can be, but it seems to be plugging pores in the reservoir rock. So you can see the anhydrite here coming up in high birefringence in the cross-polarized light picture. And over on the far right are SEM-CL images of it that show internal zoning. And if you can make sense of that, I'd like to hear from you because <laughs> I don't know what it means. So anyways, we got leachable minerals in the rock, some within veins, some within the wall rock itself. Okay, so now let's look at this by stage, maybe even by fluid type. So you see in stage three, sulfate's way up there, two, three times more than you see within stage one. Okay, and stage three also had the lowest chlorine concentrations, right? So why is that? Well, I, I have an idea. Here's a movie of the microseismic data. I think you're all more or less well versed in this by now, but we're going through stage one, now to stage two, and stage three will pop up. And this thing will spin around and make y'all dizzy. <laughs> You heard earlier from Christine Pankow that there were some issues with the locations due to you know, troubles with geophones not working at temperature. But let's just take this at face value, which we have. And our forge partner, Alita Finella at WSP has fit planes to the micro seismic data. 
So here we're looking through the to the north, kind of a view you're kind of familiar with, and looking down. You can see that stage three can be fit by two planes pretty well. And that stage one and stage two, the seismicity is kind of diffuse. And she was able to plug a lot of planes into there. So kind of in summary and conclusion, stages one and two were slick water. The, the, the seismicity was more diffuse. Is it a reactivation of natural fracture, fra fractures? Possibly. I mean, that high chlorine says it may be. We saw chlorine in the in those sealed fractures. There's halite. There's a little bit of sylvite, as John showed earlier. So we've got chlorine bearing, easily leachable fluids that you could pull out in under 30 hours by sticking in some, you know, low salinity fluid. That's going to come out really quick. Stage three, it's looking a little different in its chemistry and its microseismic pattern. Uh, it's obviously fit by fewer planes. Is this a propagated hydraulic fracture that's gone through and interacted with the raw wall rocks and pulled that and hydride out of the wall rocks? And I'll end on that uh, cliffhanger note. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Clay. Anybody wants to ask a question on the mystery? Oh. <laughs> okay. Does that, is, is that better now? Is that working? Okay, cool. Yeah. So about one in every three uh, geothermal wells in conventional systems are dry holes. And so you can imagine that that's very costly and can be prohibitive for, for developers um, to explore fields as well as getting financing on the facility side. So at Furbo, we're doing horizontal drilling, um, leveraging that from uh, unconventional oil and gas and also conventional oil and gas. When I worked at Guyana, we were drilling horizontal wells to tap into more of the reservoir. Um, understanding our flow distribution through the fractures that we're generating to connect these um, these wells. Um, you know, there's still that big question of how does the natural fracture system play into um, the overall reservoir once we stimulate these rocks, do we, you know, reinitiate or or open up some of these natural existing fractures? Is that helpful for longer, more torturous well path for heat extraction and such? And then like I said, leveraging uh, diagnostic um, through fiber optics, um, understanding microseismic to, mo to maximize our system. Um, here's a picture of our, our Blue Mountain facility um, or our pad. Um, so we are working with H&P. This is with our stimulation crew out on location. You can see the sand silos as well as um, all of the, the pump trucks. Um, and it's I, I had never been on a stimulation um, crew before. It's actually really impressive and highly sophisticated looking at all of that data coming in. So that's what we're doing on the geothermal side. Um, and this is really the time for geothermal. We're seeing a great space with startup, a lot of support from DOE, um, you know, great support from Forge, as well as a changing regulatory space where we actually have a voice um, in the room to help with permitting, um, you know, decreasing some of those barriers to entry to make sure that our facilities um, come online in a timely fashion where we can prove that they are economical and profitable. So that's what I have as an overview for uh, what we're doing. But perhaps I'll go into some of the other things that we're testing out at Fervo, and one is called Fervo Flex. And so we actually tested this during our cross, our long-term cross flow test at, at Project Red, where we curtailed the producer, continued injection, and um, over about four hours. And when uh, we opened up the producer, we actually saw an increase in flow. Um, so really using the and the benefits there is that it can serve as 
a battery. It's dispatchable. It provides a robust, you know, alternative source to the grid where we can pair that with wind and solar, depending on, um, you know, the time of day. It's dispatchable. It's easy to um, unleash. And um, it actually follows the duck curve on, on my other presentation. I had a full schematic that overlaid on the California duck curve. So that's one aspect of what we're doing in addition to our geothermal energy development. The other thing that we're working on also with the University of Utah are DAC hubs, so direct air capture. Now that is a very energy intensive process and also requires low grade heat. So geothermal is actually a great energy source to pair with direct air capture. And that's, an all, that's also an opportunity for a behind the meter solution. So another challenge that we have in geothermal is our, um, our infrastructure and grid. Um, and so seeking out opportunities where geothermal can you know, power large facilities or be paired with direct air capture or hydrogen production. Those are opportunities in the space that we think we can add additional value um, from an energy uh, perspective as well as providing um, some of our, our heat to those processes. So that's what, I, what I've got. Cool. Yeah. Our, our next speaker is uh, Christian. That's approximately right. <laughs> and and uh, um, Christian is a systems engineer at Ever Technology. He uh, is a uh, ESC honors graduate from the University of Toronto and part of technical engineering. And I might point out, with all apologies to the University of Utah, this that might be the best university in the world. So prior to joining Ever. Uh, Christian was a business analyst with the Deloitte Toronto Risk Advisory Practice, and there he specialized in, in technology and digital transformation projects across the banking, insurance, and oil and gas sector. So now you'll hear about something that's a little bit different than what you've heard uh, up to up, up to the present time. So, Christian, thank you, John. Appreciate it. Um, you're right. What we're doing is is very different. It's a bit of a topic change from all the enhanced geothermal discussion we've been having so far. So a bit of background on uh, on Ever, for those of you who aren't familiar with us, we're a closed loop geothermal company. So what we're doing is a bit different. We were founded uh, back in 2017, um, headquartered in, in, in Canada. So I apologize if most of my slides have metric units uh, on them. Um, so initially we were focused mostly on technology development and demonstrating what's necessary to build these advanced closed loop geothermal systems. And now we're entering a new phase in the company where we're really focused on commercializing this, um, this new technology. So some, some aspects I'm gonna talk about are our technical uh, accomplishments so far, our two demonstration projects, one in Canada and one in the US, and uh, our first commercial project in, in Germany, and um, our demonstration project at, uh, at Utah Forge of the insulated drill pipe technology that, that John mentioned earlier. So what is uh, an Everloop, our, our, core, our core technology? In essence, it's a subsurface radiator where we drill two vertical wells that are cased and cemented, and then 12 multilateral open hole passes um, to provide enough surface area for adequate heat exchange. Um, and then those, those multilaterals are um, not cased and cemented and are drilled open hole and sealed with our rock pipe technology. And that alone can decrease um, the per meter cost of drilling by over half. And then a beautiful part, I think, of our solution is that it circulates by itself on the thermosiphon effect. As long as you provide some cooling duty at surface, either from an organic rank and cycle to make power or for a heating application, the density difference between the cold and the hot water makes it so that it's self-propelling. And what this means is we think we have a really scalable solution here. We don't need to target um, permeable aquifers or locate specific rare geological conditions. If we drill deep enough, we're going to find heat. And if we can passively circulate this, this working fluid and pull that heat from the rock, we can build these ever loops uh, anywhere. <clears throat> so this is a core kind of evolution of our technology um, and kind of how it looks like. So the Everlight facility is what we drilled in, in Alberta and has been operational since 2019. And that's just a, a two multilateral system. 
Then our Everloop 1.0 system is our first, will be our first commercial project in Germany. And that's where we drill the multilaterals horizontal. And then our 2.0 system, which we're really planning on implementing here in the US for, for power applications, is where we tilt those laterals at an almost vertical orientation to target really, really deep hot rock. And we think that the solution is really, really scalable. Some key advantages to, to our technology that I just want to briefly mention. I know uh, Emma talked about um, dispatchability and the Fervo Flex solution. We believe we have something very similar that we call lossless load following. So by changing the circulation rate, for example, slowing it down, you can build up more heat and collect more heat from the rock and then release it to surface when you need it most. So very similar. We want to, we think we can be very complementary to uh, a grid that's heavily penetrated by intermittent renewable sources. Uh, a big core market for us is the district heating market. Because we're not looking for any particular geology, we can build these Everloops very close to where the end use is. And um, we think uh, we have a large market for decarbonizing the district heating networks in, in Europe. Um, and this is uh, uh, a market where they, there's not really any clear um, low carbon solutions and they have strict mandates to, to decarbonize that sector. And then lastly is the predictability. Our main mechanism of heat transfer is, is conduction from the rock, and um, fundamentally, it's predicted by a lot less variables <laughs> than a normal conductive system. So we can predict very accurately what the thermal output of an Everloop will be before we even drill the Everloop. And that has implications for how we finance this and the risks that um, and the cost of capital that we can, we can attain for developing these projects. So our Everlight facility is located just about an hour and a half uh, north of, of Calgary in Alberta. In essence, we, we drilled from two different surface locations and connected the well bores to two multilaterals um, uh, to, to build the Everloop system. And it's been operational for about three years. And um, uh, may, most, mostly our, our technical objectives here were actually to prove that we can drill and intersect well bores using conventional magnetic ranging technology. Most people who use magnetic ranging technology use it to avoid well bore collisions. We're actually using it to collide the well bores. Um, and prove that we can seal and pressure test the system so that we don't have a uh, leak off and demonstrate our rock pipe sealant. And then lastly is validate the thermodynamics. We got a lot of skepticism early on that, oh, you can maybe drill it, but you know, you'll, the thermodynamics are way off. You're going to make you know, one kilowatt. You're not going to make one megawatt, right? And so we've, we've proven those skeptics wrong. And now we're facing you know, <laughs> a new challenge of proving that we can actually drill and complete these really complicated ever loops and at a, at a competitive cost point. So that's where our ever deep project that we completed last year comes into play. We tested um, a lot of the art, a lot of the drilling technologies that we spent a lot of time developing uh, to enable this. One being the insulated drill pipe that John mentioned earlier, which we think can cool uh, the circulating drilling mud to, to allow for conventional drilling tools to be used. So we don't need to focus on developing high temperature rated uh, drilling equipment. We can drill using standard drilling technology and keep those, that equipment cool with insulated drill pipe. And we believe we can target uh, 400 degrees Celsius or 750 degree Fahrenheit um, rock temperatures um, with, uh, with, with this drill pipe while using conventional tools. Um, another big, uh, big milestone we achieved here was proving um, with uh, proving the, the ROP and bit life that we need for commercial projects. And this was validated by BP, who, um, who uh, triggered a follow-on investment of $10 million for us because we hit those milestones that they determined were necessary to develop commercial Everly projects. At the end of the day, our biggest uh, factor on cost is time drilling. And uh, uh, the faster we drill with the longer the bit life, the better the economics. So Garrett's Reed, this is what we're currently drilling right now. It's our first commercial project about an hour south of Munich. Uh, we started drilling back in July. We're going to finish up drilling maybe in Q2 uh, of next year. And uh, we really think that this is the key stepping stone to commercialize uh, the 1.0 technology for our heat and power market in, in Europe. So it's located right next to a failed hydrothermal site. So it's de-risked a lot of the geological aspects for it. It drilled to about the same depth and found 150 degrees C feet, but no water. So perfect conditions for an Everloop. We are drilling with two drilling rigs right beside it. Right now we're in the, in the vertical sections, but we're gonna drill those same 12 multilateral passes four times to deliver about eight megawatts electric that gets fed into the German feed and tariff, which is very, uh, very favorable at 250 euros a megawatt hour. 
And at the same time, the town of Garrett Street is building out their district heating network. And so we're going to feed into that and supply heat to that network um, uh, as it gets as it gets delivered. And then we received from the, the Innovation Fund uh, a 91.6 million euro grant. Um, do they they recognize that this is this could be a very scalable solution um, for the European heat market? And Chancellor Olaf Scholz just a couple of weeks ago attended the inauguration site to celebrate the beginning of the drilling and um, spoke a lot about about geothermal and uh, announced that their Germany is targeting a tenfold expansion in geothermal capacity um, before 2030. So lots of uh, lots of exciting things happening in the geothermal space right now. Looking more towards uh, the U.S. market. Uh, we do have uh, a plans here. <clears throat> Our big one is with uh, NV Energy, a Berkshire Hathaway subsidy. We signed a 20 megawatt PPA uh, last year um, to uh, build Everloops for, for power to retire their uh, coal plant. And we received a price premium for that PPA because of our dispatchable and load following characteristics. So utilities are starting to recognize the increased value of, of geothermal power. And our, our projects in the Western US are all hundreds of megawatts to gigawatts of focus. We think that we can really stack these ever loops together and um, retire this, this, for example, coal infrastructure. And then the last one I'll mention is the Sonoma Clean Power, which Chevron is also uh, a part of for a 20 megawatt pilot, but potential for up to 200 megawatts after. So that's my, my time for now. And thank you. Be exciting. Um, our, our final panelist is uh, Dr. Eric Upchurch. And Eric is the principal director. Thanks, John. Uh, just want to, I just have some some priming comments. I don't think I, I don't think I'm going to need eight minutes, but you never know. So geothermals, Chevron's not new to geothermal, but we're new to non-traditional geothermal. So. I want to talk about some of our aspirations and some of the things that keep me up at night in terms of uh, how we actually get how we actually get you know enhanced geothermal systems done. Now we have aspirations in both advanced closed loop and in enhanced geothermal systems. And my hats off to Ever and Fervo for being the leaders in getting getting something. I'll talk about getting something done with uncertainty at the end of this but being the leaders in getting things done with a level of uncertainty kind of lead the way. But so I'll, I'm gonna restrict my comments to EGS and uh, talk about some of the things that uh, I think would be, would lead us to possible success long-term sustainability wise. So all of, my, all of my comments are gonna be based on this model of an EGS doublet where assuming that we are fracturing, we're trying to connect wells in a relatively homogeneous rock, not different, not, not significantly different than what Forge is trying to do, that you'd have a cold water injector that we frack, we create pancake type fractures, just as for the model for this concept that, inter that intersect a producing well. So based on that concept, and having spent a fair amount of time, a fair amount of time on the Forge site while they drilled, uh, their second well. One of the one of the first things that I think is a focus area for EGS success is that we start thinking about cheaper, lower temperature, a lower tech rotary drilling bottom hole assemblies. We execute our wells thus far. I mean, if you go back and look at all the wells we're doing, let me go back. Forge is two tangent wells that you're drilling parallel to each other. Furbo's Blue Mountain project, two tangent wells that you're drilling simultaneously, that you're drilling parallel to each other. Those are not radically different than a lot of projects around the world where people have used rotary drilling systems without rotary steerables and without mud motors to steer wells in, in, in general directions uh, successfully. So one of my concerns is that we are going down the path of every well that we drill has to have a rotary steerable in the well, and I'm not convinced that we actually have to have it. Now, we actually, within Chevron, we have a lot of experience drilling wells without rotary steerables and without mud motors, paralleling faults within 100 feet of those faults for thousands of feet. Now, this, is a, this leverages a lot of our experience in Thailand. So I think we rely too much on rotary steerables. If we are drilling tangent wells 
in relatively homogeneous rocks. And we have variability in how far those wells can be apart. They don't necessarily have to be exactly 300 feet apart. They could be three to 400 feet apart. I can see a world where we're actually drilling without mud motors and without rotary steerables to get our costs down and to get our on bottom rotating time as high as possible. So one concept would look something like this. This is something that we're considering for, now we are looking at trying to execute our first um, EGS pilot in the next two years. A Couple of different locations we're looking at. But again, two, par two parallel wells. We are looking at, at leveraging some of our experience from Thailand where we run a bottom hole assembly, something like this, where we have a locked up bottom hole assembly where we have a mud motor that's part of it that, that gives us most of the RPMs for the bit, but we use what's called an adjustable gauge stabilizer. If engineered correctly and with the right amount of experience drilling in a rock, where you can utilize an assembly like this with an MWD behind it, where the adjustable gauge stabilizer, which can be, which can be in an open position or a closed position simply by cycling your pump, your, your pumps on and off, can, can use that to manage a relatively horizontal or a relatively uh, a relatively tangent well through a rock for thousands of feet. So this is, and it's more robust than a rotary steerable. It allows you to directionally steer, at least keep, uh, prevent the bit, prevent the bit from going, from, from, from building or dropping inclination with the right amount of design and experience within a rock. It's not as if, it's not as if you can make this work the first well, but a few wells are practicing with it. You could actually develop these where they could, you could be you could drill tangent wells successfully uh, without using mud motors and not without using rotary steerables. And so we intend to move in the direction of testing this when we do our, our first EGS pilot to see if we can get, at least get the first attempt at trying to do this and see if we can like some break some ground, if you will, uh, using our previous experience. What's another thing that keeps me up at night? Um, fracture geometry uh, versus injector producer separation. So John talked about this. Uh, he alluded to this early in, in his earlier discussion. And the concept of having an injector and a producer that are connected by highly, uh, um, by highly bifurcated fractures that come off using linear frac fluids or, or, or slick water, this, this concept uh, is great for yielding a lot of heat, but the extension that the fractures can get or are, are, we think can be, more, can be limited to what you could get with cross-link fluids. Now, there's a lot of discussion about trying to get further distance between producer and injector with cross-link fluids, but then the fractures are more planar, less bifurcation of the fractures, but versus this concept. Our concern is we haven't seen enough modeling to tell us that this is sustainable in the long term. It looks great at first, and Furbo's done a great job showing what the initial results look like for this but we are concerned about long-term heat sustainability from a system like this. But we don't know what the answer is yet. We think understanding what this looks like in terms of long-term thermal yield, is it sustainable versus this concept where we can space wells further apart, we may have less fracture bifurcation and interconnectivity of those fractures, but it may have longer-term thermal sustainability, but we don't know what the answer is yet. Until we get an answer, this keeps me up at night too. Another one, flow distribution control systems. Now, Fervo showed great results for this, for injection profile. They have a really nice injection profile where they're getting fluid going into most of their zones. The problem is, is that I don't know if that's actually sustainable in the long term. If you have enough experience with, uh, with uh, water flood uh, projects where you see lots of wells that are drilled into great permeability, similar permeability, but great injection profiles to begin with. Over years, injection profiles change and can degrade easily into these zones, which would be short circuiting. So the, 
the initial results that Fervo is showing are great results, but I'm, I'm not convinced in the long term that that actually is sustainable without some type of flow distribution control system. So things that we're looking into are control systems that are can be deployed in our can, can be deployed across our uh, completion interval that are autonomous and they're self-regulating, no surf, no control from surface, and that with the possibility of doing it either either as an inner completion inside the inside the initial fracture zone or cemented in place. And the, the difference between those two types would look like this would be an inner completion where let's say we have a seven inch casing here that's cemented and we've done fracture work throughout it where you would run a secondary inner completion that has injection control valves that are autonomous and self-regulating to prevent a runaway thief zone. So it's not to, it, it's, it, it's to prevent any one interval from becoming a runaway thief zone and a short circuit. The downside of this is that running something smaller inside your seven inch becomes a friction point and it we, and some concerns around that. But the tools for actually doing this exist. Packers that are good, that are packers that don't need to hold thousands of PSI. They only need to have a minimum leak rate. Those are, those are available up to 280 degrees C. Injection control devices, those are commercially available too that uh, are autonomous and self-regulating. So this is actually available and doable with a few, with a few minor modifications. But the gold, the gold standard, if we can ever get there, would be if we can have both a combination fracture sleeve and an injection control valve in the same system, where we could come in, fracture, 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 and then convert the fractured, the fractured sleeve to an injection control valve such that we don't have to have any kind of inner completion, which reduces our friction pressure within the system. So this is something that is not available yet, but we're starting to have conversations with people that build these inject that build these fracturing sleeves to understand is there a way to take existing control systems and merge them with fracturing sleeves so you can get the both you can get the best of both in one. And the last thing I want to talk about is not technical, but it's philosophical. And that's overall sense of urgency. So we need to execute, we need to execute by not having a 100% answer by executing. And again, hats off to Fervo and Ever by taking a concept and not waiting for perfection, but executing to get results. We need to learn fast by taking calculated risks. And the conversation I had continuously within Chevron is that we need to execute as if our life depends on it. And it does, it, it, it does. We need, we need to be comfortable where we're at working, but we need to have our foot on the gas continuously to try to get a solution, either prove that this works or prove it doesn't work because the clock's ticking on a, in terms of climate change. That's all I have. No, those are the things that keep me up at night. I would surprise you to sleep at all. <laughs> Fear. <Okay. laughs> so, so at this point, I mean, we're a little behind schedule, um, but I'd like to sort of have a few questions for the panelists and then we'll open it up. Uh, and, and I'll start with Emma, but please, either Christian or Eric, uh, weigh in on this. And, and one of the things that we want to see is you know, what's your vision of the, ener of the uh, energy markets landscape, say in five years and 10 years? And, and, you know, this is for commercial companies, this is a big deal. And, and so, what do you think? So, I think there's several parts, right? So, I'll start off with like our customers. So, utility companies, um, educating them on, you know, how our technology works, what Kind of what flexibilities can we have? How do we ensure that we're meeting those PPAs? We're very different than a lot of the traditional like renewable sources. And so it's been a process in educating um, utility companies in a way where um, we can deliver the products that, they, that they're that they seeking. Um, there's also the customers like Google, um, other commercial customers who are looking for um, renewables to enhance their portfolio to meet their climate. Goals. Um, and we see that that space is progressing 
in terms of you know, big companies like Amazon, data centers, things where we can support. Um, and we're, we're seeing that increased traction uh, near term. On the financing side of how do we get funding um, or project financing early on being a first of a kind project, that's actually quite challenging. Oftentimes, banks or investors, um, luckily we have a great group of investors in the DOE supporting us, but in order to scale, um, we really need to tap into different um, like financing opportunities. Um, and that's also an educational piece and usually you don't want to be the first one to invest a large sum of money on a first of a kind project. And so we're seeing some change in those types of discussions and I think um, PAID will be kind of the, the first project where hopefully we'll get some project financing and that will help unlock the project financing. Um, the LPO is also a great avenue for helping companies like us um, scale um, and really be able to enter more of the public market financing realm. Um, the other side of it is also infrastructure, right? So you look at our existing grid, so the, the, can it support you know, the power production? We're starting to see improvements um, from like the Green Link in Nevada, um, making sure that we are able to interconnect, getting our interconnection applications in early for being able to source some of our projects. And I think overall, um, what this all like, like on the big scale, a lot of it is policy and having like a coherent voice on the geothermal stage of how can we as geothermal show our value to utilities. Um, and to um, you know, government organizations and corporations in a way where there is that infrastructure support to be able to move our power around. I think the, the markets are already seeing the value of the reliability of the dispatchability. And now it's like, how, how do we actually get the infrastructure in place to actually to be able to unlock a lot of the resources, especially in the Great Basin where transmission lines, like uh, it's, it's a challenging, um, scenario that we face and I think that's like probably one of the biggest ones mm -hmm. to getting our power on the grid. Cool. Cool. So Christian, do you want to add something to that? Yes, please. Um <laughs> a lot of great points you made there. Um I'll add to the you mentioned a lot about the corporate EPA side. But I think there's a lot of changes happening on the government side. Um, so for example Governments are starting to prioritize energy sources that are more that enable more energy autonomy, right? Eliminate those external risks. For example, like Germany announcing that we want 10x the geothermal capacity and putting the policies in place to pay to be willing to pay the premium for it, to be able to price in those externalities that are a lot of times are hidden um, to develop a more sustainable and secure um, energy supply infrastructure. Um, and then to your point on the first of a kind financing, I think Ever and Pergo are in the exact same boat here. We see this big, there's a lot of money on the early stage side to fund technology development. Venture capital funds are willing to accept technology risks. You have lots of money on the infrastructure side that's looking to develop projects, but it's very little capital available to accept first of a kind risk. <laughs> and uh, the way we've gotten around that at Ever is through the through the EU Commission, and so they have they put together the EU Innovation Fund and billions and billions of euros to help put these projects forward. But we're still seeing that gap in North America, and those that level of funding is is still is still not there. And that's the kind of funding we need to move fast, like you said, to build these initial projects and get that technology commercial. I think, from my perspective, uh, my biggest concern is that we'll all there will always be an anchor being drug around by renewables until there's a carbon tax in place. And I had the same conversation with people on the CCUS side. People asked me, how is this sustainable? I said, it's not sustainable as long as people who throw their trash away that are, it's called CO2, don't have to pay for it. So average, average Americans, we have to pay for our trash to be picked up at our front step, except for CO2. Do we ever get to the point where we actually start we actually start having to pay for the CO2 trash that we put out, then the, the foot, then the actual anchor for renewables actually goes away and the, the implementation rate will be huge. Actually, this is a perfect lead in. Let's get to the bottom line here. 
I mean, and Emma will start with you. No, Christian will start with you. And and maybe you can speak with either a Canadian or a US perspective. Are there any economic incentives or frameworks that you think should be um, considered um, that will help give them a commerciality and adoption? Yep. Um, some of them already exist. So for example, the ITC uh, from the Inflation Reduction Act is hugely influential here and, and helps Jim Dermal out a lot in, in building those, those projects. But I, I'm, st I'm still gonna go back to my point around the first of the kind financing because that's where we're stuck today. It's, it's great to talk about the economic incentives once you know, we have that in place and putting together the, the frameworks for how to accurately evaluate the value of a geothermal versus a solar project versus a wind project and the overall infrastructure. But unless we prove those initial projects, nobody wants to go first, we have to go first. There's lots of people wanting to go second. How do we get past that barrier? So that the people who go second actually can go second. <laughs> Emma, well, I think generally when we look at uh, some of the larger, larger renewables, uh, we're a great complement to them. And so if you think about the dispatchable nature of geothermal, that is a very valuable space. Like utility companies, you talk to them and they're like, how do we price that? How do we figure it out? It's also a first of a kind, like, you know, what do those contracts look like? Can, a large wind farm um, that has like 400 megawatts of capacity, can we actually pair that with geothermal and utilize that transmission line in a more effective way? Uh, so I, I think we're making progress um, on that side. I think on the IRA side, there's still a lot of questions about how companies, even like Fervo being small, how do we actually capitalize on that? There are a lot of nuances in terms of apprenticeships and trying to wade through what all the definitions are and those are coming out um, as we're developing so it's like are are we doing it the right way with the changing moving target like that that still poses a fair amount of challenges but um i do think that the the reliability aspect um is very much there and um, i think we're on our path to keep going so we're almost out of time, but I will give Eric the last word. Uh, no comment on that one. So no, go, to, go to the next question. Well, we're, we're almost out of time. Ah, come on. <laughs> All right. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you brought up some great technical issues, mm -hmm. and, and Emma talked a little bit about hybridization. But what what what's your take on hybridizing geothermal with other uh, other energy? Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, everything that we talk about thus far is it's in a simplistic mode, right? We want to get we want to get some energy out of the ground, and we either want to do a you know an organic Rankine cycle, or we want to actually generate steam to, but. You're never gonna. You're not gonna get to that next level of how do you hybridize this with all the other different possible usages of it, until people see this as a reliable technology that you can put in the ground. So I could talk about you know the different the different possibilities, but it's so manifold in terms of where it could go. It's like it's like a conversation. It's a it's a distracting conversation. I see it first as all the focus on making some of these technologies, EGS and ACL. Where you can make it where it's it's viewed as a reliable source of energy at different levels of, of intensity, but once you actually have that in place, then that's when the fruitful conversations occur around the manifold different ways that this actually can be hybridized with other uh, technologies. So maybe at this time we do have a couple minutes. Um, Emma, people in the audience can post questions to the panel. Um, I 
Well, I mean, look at it from this perspective, right? So if you if you were to go with if you were to go with, let's say, one alternative to start with slick water, which then has the chance of actually driving multiple fractures off of the initial well bore. If you do that and then go to a, a cross link behind it, my expectation would be that the cross link would actually choose one or it would choose just a few of the of the multiple possibilities for where it would go, which means it's it's no different than starting the fracture with a cross link to get that extension that you want. Now, if you started with a cross link and actually drove fewer fractures initiating from the well bore and then went to a, a slick water behind that, I'm not quite sure what I'm not quite sure what the benefit would be other than the benefit would be that the slick water would have lower would have actually uh, lower friction throughout the well bore. But the, here's the issue is that if you're driving the fracture, something like what I was showing it. So, you know, we all have this this thought, this mindset of fractures that grow up a little bit and out a whole lot. And that works great if you've got stress boundaries. But look at what we're what's being done at Forge. There's not really good stress boundaries. So if you were to start fracturing with, let's say, a cross link, and then you go to a slick water, if you get the, the fracture growth is driven at the tip by the fluid that's at the tip. And there's no guarantee that you would, if you followed closely with slick water, that it would actually end up, you would continue to have crosslink at the tip continuously driving. I don't know what the outcome would be, but I mean, I, I, I get the sense this is almost like a, a water alternating gas EOR project, uh, considering, but uh, I can't really totally see what the, the benefit would be. Other than friction loss, uh, friction loss being reduced if you followed a large volume of crosslink with a slick water behind it. So long as the slick water didn't make its way to the fracture tip. Yep. So one more, last, last couple. Yeah. Um, so from what a lot of, what I took from what you guys presented this morning, showed a, a pretty good amount of possibility that natural fractures are playing a pretty big role in the heterogeneity of flow that you're getting into different stages. How, as for kind of any member of the, uh, the panel, how do you either, mitigate that that potential issue that could cause what Eric was talking about of what I call like a cold water breakthrough, either through reservoir characterization or technology. So let's get a geologic answer. With a bit of a spin on natural fractures, not just the fractures you create. So when I think of natural fractures, so we do deep fish, we're hoping that that's going to be conservative. Um, actually having a lot of natural fracture initiation may not be a bad thing from an injectivity standpoint. Um, and also thinking about the schematic of the doublet, right? Like as we grow out the field and we have fractures interacting with one another, maybe, I, don't, I mean, I don't know, because we'll see how thermal decline occurs. And we have reservoir models that we try to match. Um, so I, I honestly think it's still a big outstanding question. Um, you know, understanding our stimulated rock volume through microseismic is probably going to be a good indicator. Uh, but ultimately, it's going to come down to what is our what when we crop flow. You know, when we history match, and what are we getting out of that? And what control do we have as inputs to our model? But to steal an example from what you did in the past, mm -hmm. you use three D seismic at Kiana to help do that up front. Anything yeah. you can do so you don't just get those wells in the ground and say, darn it, $10 million down the drain. And you can use outcrops. I mean, so in the basin and range, seismic is not as valuable. Um, you know, we run FMI logs um, to try to characterize the natural fracture morphology and UBI logs. UBI is actually a little like can be a bit challenging to run in, in our lateral sections to understand our open natural fractures. Um, there's a question as to whether we're getting cooling fractures and that we're over calculating some of the FMI. So I think it's still early days on trying to figure out what data it, we have most fidelity to. I think my concern with the characterization of natural fractures, it's, it's stochastic in nature, right? It's a nonlinearity that you're going to have to deal with. 
And it is what it is. You're not going to be able to drill away from it. You're not going to be able to see it before you get there. In most cases, for the for smaller scale fractures, yeah. you have to deal with it at the inception of where the fluid goes into the rock at the injector. Now, yeah. people talk about trying to control flow inflow and in, flow into a producer, but my personal perspective on the on the whole flow network is that. All these uh, all these nonlinearities can be controlled best. It's not perfect, but can be controlled best by having flow control at the injector in long term. And it's what some elegant solution, but more elegant than what I showed on the board here, but a starting point for how you get something like that in place. Or you can drill an advanced system where you don't have to deal with any of that. <laughs> Valid point. <laughs> like to formalize that by presenting him with the exceptional researcher of the year award we are honoring a researcher whose contributions have made egi the university of utah and the entire geothermal community very proud i think everybody would agree alongside dr joe moore john has been an able pi or co-pi in forge his presence at the site during drilling and simulations stimulation was one of the factors that led to the success in Forge demonstrating interval connectivity. John has been tireless in his outreach work, giving invited lectures and attending panel sessions on Forge. His webinar on Forge, for example, that he conducted for EGI, attracted about 130 attendees worldwide. John has demonstrated a remarkable commitment to advancing knowledge in geothermal and in the field of rock mechanics in general. He continues to publish on a wide range of topics, his passion, dedication, and research contributions are really admirable. John has also played a crucial role in mentoring and nurturing young researchers, including people at EGI and graduate students. So he's teaching in the Department of Chemical Engineering, which he continues to do with all his other commitments, has also been exceptional. So we are really fortunate to have such an outstanding researcher here at EGI. On a personal note, having John as a close advisor on matters technical and beyond for EGI and other departmental matters has been an invaluable asset for me. His insights and perspectives have invariably guided our decisions. Anyway, before we proceed with the award ceremony, also please keep in mind that we have the core on display, which is a testament to uh, the Forge team's research efforts, including John's. So please. Uh, uh, take a look at that. And now with uh, utmost respect and gratitude, I'm pleased to present to Professor John McLennan, the EGI Exceptional Researcher of the Year Award. Thank you. Thank you, Melvin. Thanks. Yeah, please. Okay. And thanks to all, you know who you are. No. <laughs> you do have a couple of minutes, John, if you want to say a couple of things. All right, we um, break for lunch and reconvene at 1 p.m. Thank you all for the. Thank you. You're by himself. Like, McPherson's all right.